So, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, glad to see a lot of people today. Uh, and it's to, today is, is basically a, a, a session of um, uh, three hours um, about MISP in general. Um, so the thing is, we will talk about the MISP data model to make a kind of refresher. So if you are a new user, it's for you, it will be like, an introduction of uh, the data model of MISP. Uh, then we will go into uh, practices of encoding information into MISP, uh, which will include examples of how to include information, include uh, uh, encode information, and so on uh, from a sparse fishing case. And then, um, last but not least, uh, today we will uh, make a kind of overview of the possibility of MISP uh, to support thread analysts to create their thread landscape report. This one is a new one, um, but it's something that we, we have always in, in as questions in different uh, workshops and trainings. Um, so we wanted to talk about it today. Um, so today's a session is meant to be interactive too. Uh, so don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat. So we are too. Um, so we will try to answer uh, or even answer live or through the chat, depending on the questions. Um, and uh, we have a specific URLs for accessing uh, the different topic of today, including additional materials and so on. Um, the URLs is uh, Miss Printer 2022 on URLs, and the link is pasted in uh, the chat again, so like that you can you can connect to that one and so on. This is um, an interactive text, so if you log, log in, in GitHub uh, with GitHub accounts, you can basically modify the text uh, and so on. So if you want to add some additional things, you'll get access to a training instance. Um, Credentials are there, so you have 50 accounts. If you reuse other accounts, it's fine too. Um, if you want to have a look at the MISP instance, and there are even some example events that you can have a look at um, in uh, the um, a MISP instance. Uh, and that's basically for the introduction. So uh, don't hesitate. Uh, if you have any question in the chat and so on, we'll try to answer to make it interactive. Uh, and the recording of the session of today uh, will be available uh, later on. So I'll let uh, Sammy start on the... Uh, Data model. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so, welcome everyone. It's great to see so many people today. Like we are ninety, which is quite a lot. Oh, we are ninety-three now. It's even better. Um, so, as Alex said, um, we really like our session to be interactive. Uh, so, again, if you have any question at any point, let us know in the chat or uh, uh, in the Markdown document, and we can reply them live. But before we start, I actually would like to try something new. Um, I would just ask you two simple questions, and the way for you to reply would be to use reactions in Zoom. So to just do a, a thumbs up uh, if uh, if you think it's, it, it is true for you. Um, the first question is, is it the first time you attend a MISP training? I just want to, to check. I see some thumbs up. It's great. Cool. So I can see that a uh, few people already attended the MISP training, which is quite cool. So I hope you will not uh, be too bored today and that you will find uh, uh, some stuff interesting. Um, and the second question is just to gauge your, uh, I would say, expertise with MISP. Uh, do you consider yourself as a good or as a power user in MISP already? So I see one. A lot of people are modest, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, that's great. Th thank you for uh, for your uh, participation in this in this small pool. Uh, it's always great to, to see to see that so that we can really target better our audience. So as Alex mentioned, now we'll have a look at the, the data model. Uh, so it's just to give you uh, a quick overview of the different data structure that MISP offers uh, to encode data and the different type of data structure that you can use to attach context to the data. Um, after that, I will show like a quick example on how we would encode uh, an incident. In our case, it will be a spear phishing incident. So it's absolutely a fake incident, but it's just to show you uh, the different ways that you can create data in MISP uh, and some good practices uh, at the same time. 
afterward we'll see some best practices so the thing that you should really like do when you encode data and you will see why because on the last session it will be about creating a threat, threat landscape report and to do that we'll really rely on all the information and all the context and so on that we uh, that we use and we attach to our data so without further ado let's get started and for that i will start with the data model overview so it's a really simplistic set of slides but the idea is just to give you an idea on how things work in misp so in misp we have this is how i like to this to to see things uh, is to have two layers the first one is the data layer which holds basically all the data for example an ip address a domain name and url and so on and the second layer is the context layer this is the layer on which you will attach the context obviously um, so if you want to specify that this specific url is delivering malware this type of uh, file hash uh, is coming from that uh, type of uh, uh, malware family and so on this is the, the layer on which we'll attach this information uh, and so for these two layers we'll go uh, and see what what miss buffer for these so we'll start with the data layer obviously because this this is where the interesting things are. Um, and we'll start with the attribute. So the attribute is, as the slide says, is the most basic building block that you can have at your disposal to encode information. Um, now, it, it says typical use case. For example, if you want to encode a domain, that is what you will most probably going to use an attribute so that you can encode a domain, same for IP, for the different file hashes and so on. Um, there is just something that is, I think, quite important about attributes is that they can have like two faces. They can be either what we call an indicator or a supportive data, also called observable. Uh, so the difference between the two is uh, indicated by the what we call the two IDS flag, which means two intrusion detection system. But nowadays, it, its meaning is a bit broader. It means should this attribute be fed to my protective tool or not? So to give an example, if you have um, the IP address 8888, this is uh, um, an IP of a public DNS resolver of Google. This one is most probably not malicious. So this is what you would use uh, or you would call supporting data or observable. Um, while, for example, an URL delivering some, I don't know, malware configuration or acting as, a, acting as a C2, this is something that is malicious. This is something that should be fed to your protective tool. So for this one, you would turn the IDS flag uh, to true. Uh, yeah, we'll see how, how to do that later on in, in the example. So the second the data structure that we have to encode information is what we call MISP objects. So as you can see on the small diagram of the right side, it's basically a container that can hold multiple attributes. Um, so these objects are coming from templates that are predefined in every MISP installation, uh, and they group attributes that make sense together. For example, a file, a file object, have multiple attributes. A file can have a file name, a file size, different file hashes, uh, the actual binary of the file, so all of these attributes, you can combine them into what we call a MISP object that would be called in this case, a file. Another use case or example would be the per a person object. So you can also encode person uh, or individual in, in MISP, where the person object would have multiple attributes such as a first name, last name, gender, sex, uh, full name, email address, and so on. Um, yeah, so these templates uh, or these objects, there are more than 100, maybe 200, I don't remember exactly the exact number, uh, but we have most of use cases already covered with templates and with objects that are available by default. But the cool thing about that is if you really need to encode something that we, or that MISP doesn't support yet, you can easily create a new one. So if you were to, let's say, want to describe a plane, um, you could create a plane object and that plane could hold multiple things. So what, what is the model uh, and a bunch of stuff. 
Uh, yeah. So now for the third uh, data structure is what we call MISP event. So events, you can see them as like a large envelope that contains all the data related for the, the same concept or the same event or the same incident. So as you can see on the diagram on the right side, you, see, you can see that an event can have multiple attributes, but it can also have multiple objects. So yeah, events are what you will create in MIS whenever you want to encode something like an incident. So later on uh, in, in the next session, we'll create a fake spear phishing incident. And for that, we'll create an event because we will encode in this event all the data related to this incident. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it about event. Um, something that I want to, to, to mention additionally is um, MISP has a lot of different uh, distribution level that you can set so that you can really be granular on what can be seen by others and what can be synchronized to other MISP instances. Um, and this um, distribution, but also the context that you can attach to these different elements, such as event, attributes, and object, and so on, um, they're all inherited from their parents. Meaning that if you have um, an event that is not to be shared with anyone, all the all its attributes or child element uh, will not be seen by anyone as well, because the event has a most, a most restrictive uh, distribution. All right. So another type of data structure that we have is what we call event report. And you can see these event report a bit like attributes, but they are even more simple. Because attributes, if we go back to attributes, um, they hold value, they hold data, such as domain IP. And by holding this data, they also have some characteristics, such as a type. So when you create an attribute in MISP, you would have to specify its type first, so that you don't enter like uh, an IP address in an attribute that has the type of being uh, uh, SHA-1 file hash. So that thing stays consistent. So when you ask MISP to export all file hashes, you don't get IP addresses included in the result set. Uh, but for event report, they, they don't really have a type, it's just text. So for event report, this is where you can provide uh, a description, you can provide processes. Basically, you can provide information about the event you are encoding. Uh, and this is free text. So as an analyst, you can type whatever. This is meant for human consumption and not, not for machine consumption. And another thing that uh, we have with these event reports is that they are marked on aware so that you can add a bit of uh, syntax uh, so that you can format your document so that it's more easy to, to navigate through the document and read things. Um, we also include in this uh, event report a special syntax. So we extended the markdown syntax to also be able to reference data point that we have in MISP. Uh, but don't worry, you will see that how it works later on. Um, another data structure that we have in order to link entities together is what we call object reference or relationship. So it really allows you to create a graph out of your entities, uh, which can then be used as a, like a narrative to, uh, to describe your event. Uh, for example, you could say that this specific malware uh, has, been, uh, has been used on this specific system, that it was sent by this email address that is then downloaded uh, this malware downloads another malware, which in turn fetches its configuration from that server. So you can really create this connected graph, uh, which really helps analysts to, to understand uh, what's going on, basically. Um, so in the, in the case that uh, I'm currently describing, you would have nodes from this graph that would be uh, attributes and object. And the edges of this connected graph are the relationships. Uh, so in, in MISP, we have a lot of uh, verbs that you can use for this relationship, uh, but uh, you can also create them on the fly if you really need to. And again, we'll see how it works in practice later on. 
So this is what it looks like uh, in the user interface. So you see we have the nodes, which are some file object, and then we have uh, an IP port object. And you can see that this file is dropping this NCTOR malware, uh, which in turn drops another malware, uh, Zeus Panda Banks. And then this malware connects to this uh, domain uh, to, I don't know, maybe fetch its configuration. But you can see by just looking at this graph, you more or less understand what's going on. And it's more, more pleasant to, 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 to view a graph than viewing just a, a huge table of values. All right, so now that we've covered some of the basic built-in blocks that we have uh, in MISP, let's see what how they are structured in the application. So this is uh, the anatomy of an event. So remember, you don't have like floating data in this. You would not have a floating attributes or a floating object. They are always inside an event. They are always contained inside an event. So for this uh, small example, we have an event called fail spear phishing attempt. And uh, so you see, we have some metadata about this event. We have some context, so we'll see the context layer in the next slides. We have the intelligence visualization widgets, that's how we call them. Uh, basically, it's the event graph that is, can be viewed thanks to relationship between the entities. Uh, we have a timeline that you can use and uh, the multiple event report that you can add uh, to your event. And at the bottom, we have a list of attributes and a list of objects. All right, so now let's have a look at the context layer. So in MISP, the context is, 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 uh, is there thanks to uh, the tags. Um, but these tags, they, they come from different sources. So we have the free tags, we have the taxonomies and the galaxies. So let's see in details what, what they are and which one you should use when you want to add context on your data. So the first one is free tags. And uh, you can see that uh, users can be really creative to express the same thing using different ways to express it. So in this, you can create your tag like, like this uh, without restriction. So for example, for this TLP Ember one, this is uh, coming from one of our MISP instance. And you can see that a lot of users created the same tags, which has the same meaning, but it's represented differently, uh, which can cause a lot of issues, especially if you are dealing with automation. Because trying to like export all data that is marked with TLP Ember, uh, can be tricky in this case. You would have to use substring matches or enumerate all the, the possible uh, variation of that same concept. So this can be useful. Uh, this can be useful if uh, if you if you want to apply some ad hoc tags, or if you have your own misp instance that you have uh, your own workflows uh, in place where you can like uh, attach this context to, to your event, but usually this is not the type of tags that you want to use when you contextualize your data. Rather, you would use what we call taxonomies. So taxonomies, as it says on the slide, it's just a standardized, standardized uh, set of vocabularies. Uh, so it's, it's usually nowadays pretty well understood by everyone. And thanks to its like, Uniform, uh, uniformity, uh, it really is automation. Um, so this is an example of, uh, taken from MISP. This is the workflow taxonomy, um, and you can see the different tag that you can use. So this one can be used for collaborative work, where you can say that the event, uh, the encoding of the event is still ongoing, that the event is a draft, uh, or that the encoding is complete and is up for review for, uh, I don't know, a senior analyst, let's say. And then we have as a third uh, source of tags, what we call the galaxies. So this one is a 
bit more uh, complex than the taxonomies, uh, and you will see why. So galaxies are basically like taxonomies, so they have a concept and then some value, uh, but they are, like it says on the slide, boosted by metadata. Uh, so what I mean by that is you can attach more information to these, uh, uh, to, to these elements. For example, what you are seeing on the slide is uh, the Tredactor galaxy. Uh, and from the Tredactor galaxy, we have the APT29 cluster. So APT29 is a Tredactor. And you can see some metadata attached to this APT29 Tredactor. So you see we have the attribution confidence, which hold the numerical value. We have the suspected victim of that uh, Tredactor. So you can see United States, China, and so on. And in addition to this metadata, we can also have relationship between different clusters from the same galaxy or from different galaxies. So in this case, we have the APT29 cluster, which says is said to be similar to the APT29 from another galaxy. So basically, to come back to the terminology, galaxy or a container that contains the cluster that belong to the same like a uh, concept uh, and the cluster or the actual value. So to give another example of, of galaxy and galaxy cluster, uh, we, we have the, the country galaxy and as a cluster, we have all countries. So for example, Luxembourg would be uh, a cluster from that country galaxy. Uh, yeah. So if you are, uh, already aware about the Maitre attack framework and I, and I hope you do because it's extremely powerful and useful framework. Uh, this is how we represent it in MISP. So the entire Maitre attack framework has been mapped to uh, a galaxy in MISP. Um, yeah, and before we jump to the example, I just want to give a few words about correlation in MISP because encoding data is good, contextualizing data is good, but also seeing relationship between data that were not necessarily created by, by you is also interesting. Um, so in MISP correlation are basically links that are created automatically by the application. So you don't have to create them. Um, and they are created whenever two attributes from two different events uh, hold the same value. So I think this uh, small diagram explains it better. So if you have two events in MISP, like we have uh, on the slide, and two attributes from each of these events hold the same value, MISP would automatically create a correlation between the two. Now, what I said about holding the same value is not really true. We have three types of correlation. So the first one is the string value. So if it's an exact match on the value, so for example, if this attribute hold that beef, the that beef value, and this one also, also holds the same value, then the correlation link will be created. Uh, the second type of correlation is uh, with CIDR block. So if an IP address is contained in a CIDR block, so if this IP address that would belong to this event uh, is contained in the CIDR block defined on this event, you would have a correlation created. And the third one is SSD hash. Uh, so if you know already about uh, fuzzy hashing, uh, we use SSD. Basically, fuzzy hashing allows you to uh, view similarities between binaries. Um, so if you uh, compute a hash of a file. If you change one bit of that file, the hash will be different. For uh, fuzzy hashes, it's not the case. If you flip one bit, the hash will be extremely close to to the file of the to the hash of the file with the unflip bit. Um, yeah. So there is a threshold, a calculation threshold, when you compare these two hashes, and uh, you can adapt that threshold uh, in the setting. So if two binaries are similar, well, MISP can also automatically create um, a correlation. All right, so I, I see already in the chat a very interesting question, and this is a very tough question in my opinion. It's about 
which taxonomy should I use to avoid duplication of information? Uh, I mean, this is up to the community to, to decide, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Alex already replying. It's it's perfect. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question because, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe we can we can elaborate a bit on that one um, by by some example. Um, I'll take one I know because it's 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 one that is quite common in the CSIRT community. Uh, you might have, for example, bridge between CSIRT community and the military sector. And for example, in the CSIRT community, we don't we don't use, for example, military classifications uh, for NATO and so on. Nevertheless, we might have some military users uh, that want to be sure that the information that we are sharing is un unclassified on the military side. So what we do in such kind of instance is basically we enable the taxonomy that we use uh, as marking for the CSIRT community. So for example, TLP and PAP are the most commonly used taxonomy uh, for traffic light protocol exchanging information and for the perm you know, permissible actions protocols or what you can do with the data. And then in the NATO classifications, I will just select one, which is the unclassified one. So like that, we can reassure the people that are actually using the data. Ah, this one is unclassified, they can use it. But indeed, um, what um, uh, Biagio was mentioning, it's, it's indeed a challenging one. You need to select the taxonomy that you want. So obviously in MISP, you won't, you won't enable the 200 taxonomies that we have. Uh, it, it's, it's quite a lot, but those are, are just, imagine it's, it's just like a knowledge base in a library and uh, you might have a book of expertise in biology, some in science, some in some other topics. You might just take the books that are and the knowledge base that are mapping your taxonomies. Nevertheless, this works very well in, I would say, um, closed or limited uh, communities like Isaacs, um, CSIRT, SOC and so on. Uh, but, for example, when you want to share on a larger scale, you tend to use the taxonomy that are the most well-known. And, for example, uh, Sami was showing the documentation of, of the taxonomy that is generated automatically from uh, the different taxonomy that we have. But you see some taxonomy are really bound to a communities. For example, if we take the CSSA one, um, this one is an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's done by uh, a German Isaac. Uh, you, you can see that they have a models where uh, they have, for example, different sharing class to, to contextualize information. And that's a good way to do it. Uh, so nothing blocks you to use it, to use the CSSA one, or to even design yours. Uh, and that's, that's a way to, to do it, but it's really bound to your communities. Now, if you want, for example, for Circle, it's obviously one that we use within the CSR communities. Um, but sometimes you want to have some more, I would say, generic one. Uh, which are, for example, I don't know, uh, uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, your, uh, Eniza one, a good example, where you just focus on that one, it's more generic, and you can reuse in that one. So the selections of uh, taxonomies uh, highly depends on who will get the information, who will use it, and so on, because you want to speak the same language that they are speaking for classifications. Um, so it's, it can be challenging, but that's the thing. Another thing is, uh, in MISP, we have a functionality that we will show uh, called tax collections, um, which could enable, for example, when you have a lot of tax to select because you don't know by default which one will be used, uh, it's a kind of synonym. So you can use that one in MISP and just automatically add all the tax. So in some communities, they are using that. For example, for OSIN classifications, you might have like two or three tax. You don't want to select all the tax. So you, you prepare in advance a kind of classification, so collections of data <coughs> to to do this kind of thing. So uh, thanks for the great question because it's it's indeed a challenging one. I don't have a perfect question there. At, sorry, it's a kind of lawyer questions. It depends. Um, but actually, from the list there, you can really select what you want. And if you already have a taxonomy uh, internally, well, you just create your own and you can reuse it for your, your uh, classification. And that makes sense. In some countries, for example, they won't be in English. They will be in the national language. And that makes sense too. Um, so. Uh, cherry pick and MISP is really able to do that. You can really cherry pick the specific uh, taxonomies, uh, even on force the use of some taxonomies too in, the, in your MISP instance. Um, so it's really depending on your policy rules of your sharing community. Yeah, and in addition to all of that, uh, you are not bound to only use one taxonomy, you can also use two or three. I would not say like five because that's going to be too much. But if you want to use your own, taxonomy and, for example, a more generic one, such as, I don't know, the Europol one, uh, you are free to do it as well. 
so it's, it's really more up to, to you to decide or even better to, to check with the community that you are in uh, to agree on a specific taxonomy to use. There, there are some interesting questions from um, Jonathan about uh, forensic analysis timelines and so on, which is, I think, a super important point regarding trend intelligence of having uh, things like, for example, first scene, last scene, uh, times and so on, and in forensic is, is critical. Uh, uh, so we have a functionality in MIS called uh, timelines uh, to show the specific timelines. We can have a look at it uh, uh, during during the sessions today. Um, I'm interested to see, as forensic analysts, for example, if you're a forensic analyst and so on, what are the limitations that you have with the timelines? What can be done? But I think the, major, the most important aspect uh, for being able to build timelines in, uh, in MISP is to um, uh, inject a first scene, last scene on object and attributes, because this is basically bringing uh, in the interface, user interface, and so on, the ability uh, to automatically see the timelines. Uh, so, so that's quite, quite important. Uh, maybe we do a quick uh, talk about it um, uh, today. Uh, especially, for example, for thread landscape report, timeline is super important. How long have we seen these vulnerabilities, for example? Uh, we we'll talk about it later, but it's, it's quite important. And um, the pity is a lot of report that we still receive sometimes doesn't contain that information. Oh, all right. Okay, so... <clears throat> Let's check, I don't see other question. So before we start the actual exercise, I want to share with you something that can be quite useful, which is our wonderful cheat sheet. Um, so I will paste the link again in the chat. There you go. So the cheat sheet is uh, like a four page uh, cheat sheet that contains interesting information. So you have uh, what I call the, the glossary. So if, if there are some concepts that are not really, that I would use during the session and that you don't really know what that is, uh, maybe it's already in the, in the glossary. Uh, so if I'm talking about R deletion, if I'm talking about delegation and so on, uh, you can refer to that one. Uh, we also have a few like, uh, uh, few, few sections, uh, one about distribution and one, another one about synchronization. And further down, a small reminder of all the data model and data structure that we have. So we can recognize already the, that the, the slides were actually coming from that cheat sheet. Uh, but it, this one may, may include more information. The anatomy of the event that you already saw. And if you want to use the API or if you're a site admin of this, some useful command that can be used, for example, resetting the brute force protection, resetting a password or extracting data. From your, your from your misp instance. All right. So this is good. Um, so now second part is about encoding information. So from evidence to actionable intelligence. So for that we we have uh, a small example that we have here. So it is about uh, an incident. Uh, about spear phishing. It's a fake one, obviously. And from this incident, uh, what we will do is we'll create an invented MISP that will contain as much information as is, uh, as it's given uh, in this, uh, in this example. All right. So let's, let's quickly have a look through, through that, uh, small example. So we are receiving a mail from a C-cert of a fake company, of a telecommunication sector, uh, to the C-cert of Luxembourg, which is, let's say, uh, us in our case, or all the people in this training. Uh, and subject says, attempt, attempted spear phishing attempt. Small typo there. All right, and then it, it's, it's the, the mail starts with their XY. We have had a failed spear phishing attempt targeting the CEO recently with the following details, and then they give the details. So the CEO received an email on a specific date and the email contained a personalized message about report card of the child, blah, blah. So this is spear phishing. Uh, the attacker pretended to be working for the school of the CEO daughter and the attacker sent a mail from the spoofed address 
uh, John Doe from, uh, from the school. So John Doe is the teacher of the student and the email was received from that uh, email provider. All right, so we have few few data to encode there. So what else do we have? It says that the email contains a malicious file, a file did attach. So this is this one. And this file would try to download a secondary payload from that URL. This URL resolved to that IP address. So that's interesting. And this secondary payload, this one, uh, is said to be trained to exploit a specific CV. And this secondary payload also has an R coded C2 that uh, is hosted at that location, uh, to which uh, the, the malware sample exfiltrate local credential. And then they close the mail by saying that this is how far they have gotten. Uh, this is an ongoing investigation and they want, uh, they would like to avoid informing the attacker of the detection of the spear phishing attempt. All right. So I will just grab the malware sample. Oh, there we go. So let's start. So we have an incident and we want to encode it in MISP. So the first thing to do is you log in in your MISP instance. So when you log in, you land, uh, end up in the event index page. So this is uh, all the events that were created on this instance. Good. Uh, but what we want to do is not to, to get to, to, to view all events. We want to create a new one. Because remember, we don't have floating data in MISP. All data that you encode are always contained inside an event. So for the thing, we click on add event. Then we need to provide a bit of information for that event. So we can provide a date, uh, we can provide the distribution setting. So distribution setting, we will not talk too much about it because this, this, uh, this session today is not about sharing and collaborating, but it's more about creating data and the best practices to create data. But basically, you have multiple distribution level that you can set so that you can really decide who can access the data and how it should be synchronized. Uh, so for the purpose of uh, our session today, we just use your organization only for now. And later on, I will switch it to something more broad once I'm done encoding the event. Um, then you can add some meta information about the thread level of that event and the analysis. So if the analysis is still ongoing, if it's completed and so on. So in our case, it's ongoing and the thread level, let's say it's medium. If you want to be more precise on these aspects, thread level and analysis, uh, it's better to use a taxonomy for that. We have different taxonomies that can really cover these two topics. All right. And then you have to provide information about that event. If we go back to our event index page, you can see that we have a bit of data shown there. So we have some context that I will write for now. And we have the info. So this is what will be visible on the event index. And this is what um, the users of that MISP instance will get when they will be notified that a new event has been created. So it's really important to, to take and to pick a concise uh, event description or event information that really says what this event is about. So that when you read about that notification, you see, oh, okay, so now I'm, I just received or someone just created an event about something. So in our case, we could use, uh, that's perfect too. So you can see that I already did the exercise once or even twice, actually it's a bit more, but Let's stick with that. Uh, phase per phishing attempt targeting, and I, I like this one, telecommunication company Luxembourg. I think it's pretty concise and it really tells me what this event, this event is about. Uh, and let's skip for now the extend event. Uh, it's not really that interesting. So I'm quite happy with that. I did submit. And now I have my event that has been created. It's empty, but we'll fill it out. 
So let's see what happened when we created an event on this instance. So we can see it got some data signs, such as an ID, um, the creator and the owner of organization. So as the SAMI Academy user, I'm, I'm belonging to the training organization. So that's why it says that the organization that created the event is called training. Um, then we have, you can see some tags that were that automatically. So this is an instance specific configuration that we have. Um, you can configure it to add other type of tags, really up to you. Uh, but yeah, for, for our current use case, this tag don't really apply. This is not TAP white. And uh, this is not OSINT information. So I can get rid of these tags. Oops. Uh, workflow state draft. Yeah, it's it's a draft, so I can keep it. Um, you can see now that I've removed the TLP tag that MISP is complaining, saying that, hey, you have a taxonomy missing. You have the TLP taxonomy missing, which is required on that instance to be on every event. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, Alex mentioned that you can do to force really the use of specific taxonomies on your instance. All right, so let's proceed. We have the date, blah, 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 distribution. A big warning saying that this event is empty. So that's perfect. Uh, and that's normal. We, yes? We have an interesting discussion about sharing ah. distributions. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as you were close to the distributions label on the event. Yes, table. yes. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah. Let's have a look. What is it about? Oh, plenty of messages. Uh, yeah, it was a simple question, but I think quite good. It's like uh, where this information is flowing uh, by default and so on uh, when you create an event. Um, just all right. To keep, to keep, yeah, you can maybe. All right, that. let's 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 have an overview then of the different distribution that we have. So I will go back to this one. So we have let's say four simple distribution. Oh, actually, I have I have even better. Give me one second. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Oops. Give me one moment. And uh, thanks to DFIR uh, Cerebro for these uh, questions. So like that we can just, like, <laughs> change a bit of the flow of the uh, presentation. Of today. But that's, that's good. That's a very good point because obviously MISP uh, is doing sharings and so on. And uh, uh, Sami will, will, will show with practical examples. Of, uh, practical, practical. Not sure, but at least to give the the theory, uh, let's say. Uh, at least people can share it because <laughs> the sharing model they want. Yeah. So it, this is why we love to have interactive questions and so on because we can really uh, dive into what people are interested in. So please keep keep that coming. Uh, so distribution. Um, so we have like four basic distribution settings uh, and one special case which is called sharing group. But we'll come to that in a moment. So the first one is organization only, which means only the creator organization that created the event. So in our case, with our event, oops. so as I'm the creator organization of that event, as I pick your organization only, only the training organization can view uh, this event. And so that means all the users from that training organization. So the second distribution setting is called this community. And community is a special, uh, I don't want to say play word, but uh, basically we consider uh, MISP community as a MISP server. So in our case, this community means all the users that have access to that MISP instance. So if I were to change this, the distribution of that event to this community only, that means all users that have access to that instance. So let's view the users. Uh, it doesn't matter which organization they are, uh, they are part in or they are from. They will have access and they will be able to view the data. So you can see this is the training organization, but we have the MITRE, the circle organization, certain age, certainty, and so on. And so this one can also, uh, this organization and the user from this organization can also view the data. Then we have the third one, which is called connected communities. 
and now we are entering the synchronization world uh, because you, you already and most probably know that you can interconnect MISP instances uh, to have synchronization. And so for that, I will use that small diagram. So the boxes are MISP instances. Uh, you can see we start in this example, we are starting from the gray MISP instance. Uh, you can see we have four organization on that instance. And we have this box called this community that shows that only the organization that are contained in that MISP instance can view the data. Now, if you were to choose connected communities, that means that obviously all organizations from the community can see it, but all instance connected to the gray MISP instance can also uh, view the data. So it, the data will be synchronized to these instances. And we have the last one, which is all communities. And in this case, it goes up all the way to the purple MISP instance. Uh, so how do we know which one uh, should you use? Basically, if you want to share it as far as the topology of connected MISP instance allows it, you would use all communities. If you only want to share it with your instance and all connected instances, you would use connected communities. So if you use connected communities, it's only one hop away from the current instance. And how do we actually achieve that? Basically, when the event gets synchronized to the red and the yellow one, the distribution setting of that event uh, dropped from connected communities to this community so that it stays on that instance. And now for the last one, the distribution lists, also called sharing groups. Uh, it is a way for you to list which organization can have access to that data. So if we have a sharing group called the blue sharing group that contain these four organization, and we create an event under that sharing group, only the organization that are listed in this sharing group, so these, the, these two, can, uh, can view the data, but not these two. And how does it look like in MISP? If you choose sharing group, then you can pick from any of these sharing group. So if I take a test sharing group, uh, I submit, and now only the organization containing this sharing group can view the data. So if I check this sharing group, uh, I only have one instance, uh, one organization, third PT. Okay. So if you are a bit lost, uh, which distribution should you use? And so on, you don't really remember. I refer to you to the cheat sheet uh, that once again contain information on how things are distributed. Or you can alternatively use the user interface. So if you click on this small uh, advanced sharing network viewer button, it shows you uh, yeah, a small example. This is not really accurate. Connected communities. Interesting. Um, this is kind of new. Let me check again. The event is empty. Ah, maybe this is because it is empty. Uh, yeah, let's fill it. Yeah, let's, it let's, sense, yeah. uh, and, and then if you fill it, there's a question that maybe they ah. will answer and like that they can see it, uh, see it directly. Um, mm -hmm. so what um, uh, DFIR uh, Cerebro was mentioning, uh, you want to see a specific sharing or distributions on a specific what you call column of data, so set of attributes and so on, to show that you can modify that. So the event itself can have, for example, all community distributions, and then you can have a specific distributions on specific attributes, but we will see it. So that's, uh, yeah, that's exactly. There is another question that was about uh, the connected communities. So indeed, connected communities, just to make a recap, is the MISP instances that are N plus one. So that means mm -hmm. if you have a community that is connected, you have all your uh, nodes that are connected, and then you have the additional one, the different ones that are connected, which are n plus one. So that means the information will flow n plus one with those communities, and the information distribution will be degraded to reach a proper level uh, on 
Und so ist es Community. Und so ist es Miss Ja, yeah, I, I will not uh, talk too much about synchronization because we have two mechanisms. We have the push and pull. And depending on which one, the behavior on the degradation of the distribution is slightly different. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, we can we can talk about it uh, at the end of the session today. Uh, but yeah, this is like a rule of thumb. If you put it connected communities, it means n plus n plus one. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's go back to our event. If there are no more questions, otherwise, Alex, please let me know so that I can can talk about that. Um, and then start to actually encode the data because now we just created the envelope. So we just created, uh, up, up, up. Oops. we just created like the, the event, but now it would be cool to actually <laughs> add data to this event. So let's see, what do we have? Um, unfortunately, in this example, we don't have the actual mail that was sent from the attacker to the CEO. So we just have a summary of what happened from the fake company, but we don't have the actual mail, which is a bit uh, sad in our example, because if, if you would have had the mail, we could have encoded it, but we don't, so too bad. Uh, that's something that we could do as the next step, for example, to add a specific context and say, this event is missing information, please get in touch with the reporter and to request that information. All right, so, um, yeah, so maybe what we can do first is to encode that uh, John Doe person so that we can have a link to that email address and, and describe the fact that this email address sent a mail which contained this information. Um, yeah, if, if we would have had the, the mail, it would have been cool as well. So first thing, uh, we would need to create attributes or object. So which one should we choose between attribute and object? What do we want to encode? We want to encode the email address. We want to encode John Doe. And we want to encode its relationship to the incident, which is the teacher of the student. So we have three, three data points that we want to encode. And they're all linked between each other. So in this case, instead of creating three separate attributes, I will create an object to group them. So to create an object, go on add object, and then you have to pick a category. So as I never know in which category they are, I pick all object and then I can search for it. So I know that I want to create a person object. Um, yeah, person seems good. I click on person. And now I have to fill not everything, but I have to fill some of these fields. The template requirement for a person object to be valid says that the person object must have at least one of these, which is fine because we, we know about the first name, last name, and so on. Um, so let's, let's go through that form. Uh, function, what is the function of that person? Teacher of CEO's daughter. Last name, we know the last name. Full name, we also know the full name. First name, oops, a small typo. Full name is this one. Uh, we don't have a portrait, no, no, no. We don't have an address. Oh, we have an email address. So that we can also encode. All right. Text, a description of the person of entity. Actually, I think it, it would fit even better than function. Where is it? There. Mm, yeah, we don't we don't know we don't know. Seems good gender. Let's say that is a male. Let's submit, and now we we'll end up in this uh, pre-save review page where we can verify that everything we have encoded is correct, and it seems to be correct. So I can click create. Oof! Misp says object saved, and now I have my object. Uh, that has been saved. So what else do we have? We have 
that email provider. So we have, we know that the mail was sent uh, from that email provider. So we have a domain and we have an IP address. And we know that this domain resolves to that IP address. So we could create two attributes in this event. Uh, but as these two are kind of linked, uh, I could create an object that would contain the two. So to do that, once again, I go on add object. Uh, this time I know that this is about some network category. Um, and I want to encode a domain and an IP address. So if I search for domain, I see, oh, domain IP, that's perfect. To make sure that the template is correct, I can read the description, a domain host name and an IP address in this double. That's awesome. That's exactly what I need. Um, and it, this template requires one of these three. So IP domain, and we have the two. So that's, we have everything we need. So let's take the domain. Oh, I said the domain. Uh, host name, we could put the host name if you had one, the IP address. We don't have a port, that's it. Now, what, what if we had two IP addresses or two domain name, let's say, Trawe Provider and Trawe Provider 2. Um, we can encode this and you can see Below the domain and below the IP, we have this small uh, uh, down arrow. If we click on it, it reveals another field that we can fill for that uh, same attribute. So in this case, we could do this, uh, like provider one and provider two. But as we only have one provider, yeah, I don't need this one. So it seems good. Click on submit. It's time to review our object. Oh, we have the same, that's perfect. I can create that object. And there we go. We have our domain IP. Okay, so let's proceed. Uh, it says that the email contains a malicious file that would try to download the secondary payload. So let's attach this file to our event. So in MISP, if you want to attach uh, or to add attachment. By attachment, I mean uh, malware samples, uh, pictures, PDF files, Word files, basically any file. Um, you have to click on add attachment. So let's click on add attachment. Doing this now, I will take the small sample. So you can see the form is uh, much simpler this time. We have to choose the category. Uh, so we are in the payload delivery category. We can choose a distribution. We can add a contextual comment. So in our case, I can say that it's uh, perfect. This is the initial payload received by mail from the spoofed address. So this contextual comment is not required, but it's, it can be useful if later on you have a big event, you don't really know what they are. And it's, it is especially useful when you start adding the different relationship between your objects. Uh, then you have to choose a file. So we have it there. There we go. And then we have two checkbox. The first one, you can specify if it is a malware sample or not. And the second one to perform advanced extraction. So when you are attaching uh, a file and it is, and you know that this is a malware sample, make sure to always have this checkbox. Uh, on. Uh, because if you do, this will automatically compute the different file hashes for that file. It will create an object out of this file and it will encrypt uh, the, the file so that when people download it, they don't accidentally execute it. And I'm not kidding, it happens. We know people that executed a malware sample. So please make sure that it is always on. Um, all right, advanced extraction. Uh, this is using the, the leaf uh, Python library, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to perform advanced extraction on the malware binary. So it will extract the different PE section and so on. 
and create object out of that. So in order to keep our event like lean and not too cluttered, uh, I will uh, let it unchecked so that it's easier for us to navigate and to understand. All right, so let's upload. It says the attachment has been uploaded and you can see now we have the file object. So we have the actual binary, the file name, the different file hashes, even the size in bytes that was added. And our small comment. Okay. So next one is the secondary payload. Let's do it after because we know that this secondary payload is downloaded from that specific URL that resolves to that uh, IP address. So let's encode this. So we have again two possible attributes, one of type URL and one of type IPv6 or IP address. But these two are linked again because this URL, well, the domain of that URL resolves to that IP address. So instead of creating two different attributes, I will create an object that would contain the two. So let's take the URL. Let's go on add object. This is network. And then let's create a new URL object. So I can paste the full URL there. Uh, I can put the domain. I could put the domain without TD, but let's not do it. I could put the host. I need to put the IP address. Uh, a port. Do we have a port? No, we don't. So we don't need that. Uh, query string. We don't have query string. Resource path. We do have a resource path. And scheme. This is HTTPS. I think that's good enough. So I can click submit and it's time for me to review. And it seems pretty okay. So I'm happy, I'm happy with it. Create new object. And there we go. We have our URL created. So now that we have our URL, uh, we can encode the secondary payload. So once again, you click on add attachment uh, so that it's faster for us to do it. And MISP also computes automatically the file hashes. So let's take our secondary payload, say that it is secondary payload. Um, this is again a malware sample, so make sure that we, we say to miss that it is a malware sample. Um, yeah, and I can upload it. There we go, so we have our secondary uh, binary. So let's proceed. We are almost done. Because what we have to do now is to encode that CV and that second URL. Uh, so this CV, for this CV, I want to include it in the event to describe the fact that this CV is being exploited by that binary. So in, in, in this case, I will create this time, not an object, but an attribute, and you will see why in 20 minutes. So I will paste the CV and I know that in order to create a CV, I have to use um, external analysis and then vulnerability. Uh, yep, that's good. Click submit and now I have created that attribute. All right. Now, last but not least, once again, a URL where its domain resolved to that IP address. So we have once again two components uh, and we can create an object for that. So add object. I want to encode a an URL. Uh, I can paste the URL. I can put a comment because that can be useful. We know that this is the hard-coded C2, where 
<clears throat> the credential filtration uh, is sent to. So you can put R, call it C. Um, domain, yes, we do have a domain. Uh, domain without tilde. Uh, host. You see, we, we could like elaborate on that, uh, but for that I will show you a trick. Uh, query string. We don't have a query string, but we do have a port. And as this is a very high port, I think it's interesting to include it as a separate attribute. If it were like, uh, if it was 443, uh, not really interesting, uh, but th as this is a very high port, it may be interesting, especially that we know it's using HTTPS. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. Resource path, query string. I don't think we have it. Or maybe we have a query string. No, not here. Just need to add the attributes, uh, the IP attribute. And seems good. No, no. Submit. Quickly review. Mm, seems correct. Uh, before you stop there, yeah. there's a question that is related and was from, uh, uh, I think, from Camille uh, in, in Austria. Um, it's about the uh, existing objects that are there. Uh, mm -hmm. so... I was about to, to, to talk about this one. Awesome. So... Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in this case, you can see that we have a small uh, card that is displayed by MISP that says that this event already contains an object that is similar. Uh, which is a bit weird. Did I make a mistake? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, I may have done a mistake. Hail rider. Uh, okay. Uh, no, never mind. Okay. So, Miss uh, says that we have an object that is similar. And it shows us the object in question uh, with the differences. So, it says that the first object has this attribute and this one doesn't. Uh, the scheme is the same for both objects. The URL is different. Uh, the domain is different. The IP is different. Uh, yeah. So you can really, if you think that these two objects should be merged into one, you could review and merge. Uh, and then you would be proposed an interface where you can choose how to combine the different information. But in our case, this is not the case. These two objects are distinct. The first one, the first object is this one uh, uh, from this from this information. This is the location from which the secondary payload is downloaded. And the secondary object is this one uh, coming from this information. And this is the location of the hard coded C2. So in our case, these two concepts are different. These two objects are different. So I don't want to merge them. So I can create my new object. And there we go, we have our URL. Um, now, let's see. Uh, do I have, because uh, I just want. I have, I have some, some pending questions, or at least to show some, some stuff to, to people. I don't know if you want to do it now or later, but I just like summarize them. Um, it's for the object aspect. Um, so uh, how to uh, uh, create objects from a set of attributes. So mm -hmm. you know, this is the attribute created and you want to create an object. Um, maybe you want to show it. Um, and this, there were a question about inherit distributions. Is it better to use it or not? Uh, which was a good question. So what I mentioned in the chat is uh, technically it's better to keep inherit when you don't exactly know because like that you can change a complete distribution level and set at even level the distributions. That makes sense. But in some cases, you want to uh, do it by default uh, with a restrictive aspect. So if, for example, you have an object with, uh, with for example, personal information or thing that, for example, like the thing that you don't want to disclose, then you want to use inherit by default and then select the proper distribution levels. That, I think it's a good question, but I think you will show it afterwards too. Yeah, this is kind of spoiling the the, 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 the follow-up. <laughs> but this is very good. It, it, it really shows that people are... Uh watching attentively. Um, so you mentioned creating object from attributes, um, and I will raise also another point, which is creating object faster uh, than 
having to decompose everything that I did. Uh, so this is my development instance, a lot of test data there. Uh, but I just want to show you th something. If you are using uh, MISS module, which is uh, an enrichment service uh, that MISP also has by default, you just need to enable these. Uh, you can quickly create an object out of an attribute. And in our case, it is, uh, I will show an example for the URL. So I will take that big URL that we had. And if you remember for that one, we had the full URL, the domain, the host, the, the port, and so on. Uh, this is something that could be automated. We just need to explode that URL and then construct an object out of this port. Uh, and MISP can do that for you. If you click on populate from and then URL import, then you can paste one URL. You can paste multiple URL. You click on import and poof, automatically MISP will generate an object for you uh, that you can submit and then you have it created in your event. So if, if you have to encode a lot of URL and you want to perform this uh, exploding and constructing an object out of its part, uh, I really advise you to, to have a look at, uh, at that MISS module enrichment service so that it can save you hours. Uh, so this was an example for URL if you need for other type of object. Uh, it's not too complex to to integrate as well. Now for the uh, second point. In, in addition to that, for the mm -hmm. modules, uh, email modules, for example, you have the email import, things like that are there in the MISS module too. Um, so you can do a lot of import in different kind of uh, uh, things. So the one that Sami show is, is the URL expansion, which is like a super gain of time and so on when, when you need to import a set of URLs because you can do it uh, quite quickly. Um, Nevertheless, there are a lot of other modules, so don't hesitate. I, I know a lot of people that are not enabling this module by default because they are optionals. But if you look into the MIS module, you have plenty of new functionalities and functions that you can do it. So if you have a MIS install, double check if you have MIS module uh, enabled. And if it's enabled, you can just cherry pick the module that you want. Absolutely. Uh, so the second point was about creating an object out of existing attributes. Um, so I will create this attribute, I will create another attribute, uh, it will be uh, two. So I have two attributes and I want to create an object out of it. It's quite easy. You just need to select them. And then you see, when you select an attribute, you have some option that appear on the top. And you have to click on this one, group selected attributes into an object. Click on this one, you get an interface that proposes you uh, the type of object that you want to use. So in our case, I will use the domain IP one. So I can click on domain IP, I don't know what this is doing. But yeah, so I can quickly review. I can see that this google.com is indeed a domain. This 222 is indeed an IP address. And if I click on merge above attributed to an object, now I get automatically an object created out of these two attributes. So it can also really speed up uh, the, the thing, the, the encoding part. OK. Um, this is not too bad. Huh? I think we've covered everything. OK, so to come back to the distribution once again, uh, specifically about the inherit distribution uh, level. So in our case, our event is set to this community only. Let's change that quickly. No, that's fine, actually. Let's keep it this community only. So that now everyone that has access uh, to this MISP instance can view the data. But we have some technical data, which is cool to, to give access to others. But maybe this one, especially the victim, we don't really want to disclose that information. So what we can do is we can choose between restricting the entire object or just some specific attribute. So let's say that for our case, I only want this attribute to be visible to my organization. So now when another organization such as Circle in this case 
would log in this, means, uh, this server, look at this event, they would see the entire object, but not this attribute. So they wouldn't know that this John Doe is the teacher of the CEO's daughter, because we have restricted the distribution level. And now, I hope <laughs> it is still working. If we click on this one, we can see a quick overview of how things uh, are distributed with the distribution graph. So I can hide, uh, let's see, for example, for all attributes, an object attributes that have both. Um, so you can see that we have a lot of object attributes that have the distribution set to this community only. This is because they are set to inherit, and as they inherit the distribution of the event, which is community only, so they also have this community only. And now for this small red, this is the your organization only. So this is this, where is it? There we go. This is this attribute. All right. And now hopefully this will work. Awesome. So if you click on this uh, advanced sharing network viewer, it shows you who uh, as an organization can view the data contained in this event. So we have the event, we have the training organization, but as this event is set to this community only, we end up in the this community only, and this community includes all these organizations. Uh, well, there are 17 not shown. If we had the distribution setting to connected communities, we see that it's much more organization because in addition to this community, we also have all the connected communities, which means all these MISP servers. All right. There were other interesting questions. About mm -hmm. Is those rules apply for the SCL distributions on the API too? And yes, indeed, you are an API have same SCL, same stuff. Mm -hmm. The only exception that we have in the system is the zero MQ Kafka feeds, where you basically have all the data, uh, which is a special case because it's basically an operator of the instance having access. Um, so indeed, with ACL API and so on are applying the same rules so for distribution and security and so on, it's the same. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now that we've encoded all our data, um, <clears throat> we can start adding the context, right? So uh, I think I can get rid of this one. I can get rid of this one. Yes. Okay. So for that uh, context, <laughs> Miss is telling us we are missing one taxonomy, TLP. So let's add this one. So to add tags, we click on this small add tag button. And then we have to, to choose from which taxonomy we want to add a tag. Uh, in our case, it's the TLP one, so I can search for TLP. Click on this one, and then I get a list of tags from the TLP taxonomy. So which one should we use in this case? Um, well, um, the fake company asks us uh, to only, uh, where is it again? Only use the content information to protect your constituent. So we can protect our constituent. Uh, so in our case, my judgment is uh, I will use TLP Ember. This is up for debate. I don't want to debate about the use of TLP Ember, TLP Ember strict and so on. This is not the purpose of that exercise or even TLP green. I just consider that it's TLP Ember and I think it's a pretty good fit for our case. So I can hit submit. Now you see Miss is not complaining anymore about the missing TLP tag. Uh, what else could we add? Uh, well, we know how to distribute the data, so how about the releaseability of the data, but we don't know, we haven't provided information about what can the recipient do with the data, or what can they, what are they allowed to do with the data? Um, so in this case, uh, the fake company asks us to uh, avoid informing the attacker of the detection. So that means, I understand it as, please do not scan the attacker's infrastructure. 
So for that, we have a specific taxonomy that is really about what you can do with the data, and it's called the PAP taxonomy. So it's really similar to the TLP one, but this is not about releasability, this is about permissible action. So if you have a look at the PAP Ember, PAP Ember says that the recipient of the data may use that information to conduct online check. So that means you can perform uh, queries on third-party services like various total uh, and so on. Uh, and I think this is a pretty good fit because using PAP Ember prevents us to query the attacker's infrastructure, but still allows us to, to view and to check uh, online if this, uh, this information was uh, uh, well, well, it's also re already known, let's say. Okay. Now, what we can do is to provide more information about the, the specific incident that we are currently dealing with. So we know that this is a phishing. And for phishing, we have also a dedicated taxonomy for that. And I really like this one. We we'll see why. We have plenty of uh, options. And actually, I want to see it in a bit larger screen. Uh, oh, we have plenty of phishing taxonomies. Why is it? Ah, there we go. There. Okay. So what do we have? Action, the, the distribution mechanism that was used for that, uh, for that phishing, the principle of persuasion, uh, psychological acceptability, the technique that was used, the state, if it is uh, active or down, and so on. So we can add this information. So we know that it was email spoofing. Uh, what else do we know? We know that it is spear phishing. Uh, what else? Uh, we don't know the state. Could say that it's active but it's not really hosted online or uh, anything so still don't know maybe it's down now for that we need to check um and then what else do we have what is really interesting here it's it's sami is basically selecting a set of phishings and the techniques the distribution and so on used and it seemed a bit cumbersome to do so but if you do it later on, you can really benefit from it. Um, the big advantage of it is um, this, for for example, for trade report uh, landscape that we will talk about later, it's really interesting. Instead of having a statistic like we have, like, I don't know, 25% of phishing, we can say that um, the uh, psychological acceptability of those phishing were low the past two months, were high layer months. Uh, we can say that we had more spear phishing than email spoofing uh, and stuff like that. So even if it's at the beginning a bit cumbersome to use that and so on, but if you can automate, for example, some of the type that you are using, uh, you can really, really benefit from it. Um, so it does, it's not a gadget, to be honest. It's really something that you have and you can use for um, having trending statistics and so on, and even to really better understand what's going on in, 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 in the adversary world and what the trade actors are actually doing. Yeah, absolutely. And if you manage to automate it, I mean, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have all of this information. Uh, and if you go even more, if you want, if you want to go even more crazy about that, you could even use information about the real, re re reliability of the source or the credibility of that information that was given. Because as you are not really the, the creator of the data, uh, the creator of the, well, you are the creator of the data, but the origin of the data is not you. It is the fake company that gave you, that sent you that mail. Um, you could say that, okay, these guys are usually reliable and that this information is also like uh, possibly true. But yeah, this is uh, already like going. <laughs> going crazy about contextualization. And this taxonomy, for example, Admiralty Scales is used by a lot of organizations, is really one to enable. It's it's kind of, I would say, standard and global taxonomy that are used by many organizations and so on that make a lot of sense. So going back to the initial question of someone asking which taxonomy should I enable, those one, estimative language, are the most important one to have for trade intelligence.
Yeah, I think like TLP, PAP, workflow probably, and admirality scales are, are really good to, to enable. Um, all right, so I think that's pretty much it for the taxonomy. But we are still missing information about the, the sector. So which sector was impacted, uh, which country uh, was the target, and which techniques were used by the attacker to conduct this attack. Uh, I think it's extremely, extremely valuable to have that in your event as well, especially to create trend uh, threat landscape reporting. So let's start with the easiest one, the sector. Uh, so I don't really know if you have, I don't really remember if you have a sector taxonomy, but I know that you have a complete uh, one uh, in the galaxy uh, concept. So for this one, similar to object, you have a namespace or a category. I'd never know which one it is, so I always pick all namespace. And now we have to choose the galaxy and we'll take the sector galaxy. And now we have all the sectors available and we know that this is about the telecommunication sector, so I can start searching for tele and we have telecoms. That's perfect. Now we have added the sector. That is good. Now we still need to add the target country. So which country was targeted? In this case, it's Luxembourg. So in this case, uh, can go all namespace. We could use country. But country, I think it's uh, it would be a good fit, but we don't really know if we put country, if it is the origin, or if it is the target. So for that, you would need you would have to create uh, what we call a, a tag relationship to describe that. So we could either go that uh, that route, so to create a country and to create that tag relationship, or we can use another galaxy that is actually meant to describe targets and it's called target information. And in our case, it is Luxembourg. So now we know the sector, we know the target. That's perfect. Imagine now to construct a thread, a thread landscaping, you could do that for the chemical sector, for the banking sector, for the telecommunication sector, and you could do that also per target country. This is great. Um, all right, so now we have these two data points. Now let's add information about which technique were used uh, by the attacker. And for that, I will refer to you to the Maitre attack framework, uh, which is an incredible framework. Uh, if you don't know about it, I really recommend you to have a look at it. Uh, I'm sure Alex will paste a reference in the chat about that, uh, that initiative. It's absolutely awesome. Uh, and you can see we have this matrix uh, where you can depending on the different phases, uh, specify which technique were used by the attacker. Uh, so we can also encode this information in MISP. And for that, I will take all namespace. You see, we have this attack pattern. It shows a matrix. Uh, it is actually almost the same as the, the one I showed you before. So if you, are used to, if you are actually used to that matrix, you can use it as is. Or what you can also do is to uh, use the drop down uh, so in space to use the drop down if you click on this small button there. And then you have the list of all techniques. So for our case, uh, what do we know? We know that the attacker performed phishing. We know that he performed spear phishing. And we know that there are um, exfiltration of local credentials. So let's start with phishing. Oh, we have plenty of them. So spear phishing with method by sure attachment. This is exactly what we need. Uh, let's let's see what else do we have. Oops. Um, with text only. No, that's not true. Spear phishing via service. No spear phishing for information. Then, if you are not really sure if these techniques apply, you can just over of uh, over that uh, small eye icon, and it will show you a description of that technique. Um, spear phishing attachment. Mm, that seems good. It is actually a good one, so we could take it. Uh, what else could we add? And we can put the general phishing one. 
Yeah, it's not too bad. So we've added information about our spear phishing case, uh, but we still we are still missing information about the exfiltration part. Uh, so I believe we have a technique for exfiltration. Ooh, plenty. Um, we don't really know because the fake company didn't tell us uh, how the exfiltration is done. We just know that the exfiltration is automated, uh, oh, like this one. Exfiltration over C2 channel, this one can also be picked. Good. I can hit submit. And now I have a pretty good uh, information about which techniques are used. So I can view them like this, or I can also view them with uh, a heat map, like a heat map of the, of the matrix. If you are used to, to that uh, representation. Okay, not too bad. So now we still need to contextualize our data in itself because right now we have created the data, but we haven't still created the relationship between these different entities. Um, so what do we know? Well, first of all, we know that um, we have a, a person, so the email address that sent a file, which was uh, malicious. So to do that, we could go over this one, click on add reference, and then we can add a reference or so to create a relationship between this person object to the, the, the malware object. But this is not really convenient to do that, especially that we are now currently dealing with nodes and edges. Um, so it's easier to do it via the event graph. So if looking on event graph, it shows a widget uh, that currently is not really interesting because we don't have any relationship. Uh, so if you, if you need some information about the shortcut available, just over, over that small icon. Um, so we have all these objects that are on reference. What do we know? We know that this person sent this malicious file. Can click on edit, add reference. Oops, oops. I can take, uh, I can specify the type of relation that we are dealing with. So it's uh, sends. That's good. And you can hit submit. Oops, there we go. We have created our relation. Let's continue and let's see what else we have. Um, what do we know? We know that this file downloaded the secondary payload, if you remember this one. So we can create a relationship again. So for that, to quickly create one, I can click on, I can press the shift key and oops, drag and drop, say that this one downloads and submit. Then I need to expand this one again. What else do we know? Uh, if I remember correctly, this file uh, was downloaded from a specific location. Uh, which is uh, this one. So that URL, that URL. I, I don't really see which, uh, what are the attributes, so I can press X to expand it. And I don't see the thing I'm interested in. So let's check this one. And I can see the resource path. This is not malicious. This is our URL. So I can say that this one was downloaded from. Yes. Good. Uh, I could also say, I have the email provider there, that this one was received from. Ah, we don't have received from. So what can we do then in this case? You can use the special keyword custom, and then you can enter whatever you want. Oops. Cool. Now we only have one object left, uh, which is this URL. This is the C2 server uh, uh, to which the, this binary exfiltrate credentials to. So what I can say is I can say that it is exfiltrate to. Ah, that's not bad, huh? 
I still have one attribute there that is still unreferenced, and it is the CV, and we know that this secondary payload is trying to exploit that CV. So I can add this information as well. There's a quick question about uh, where did you click to create this graph? Just ah, yes, yes, it is there, even graph. So all the trade intelligence widget, uh, you can toggle them in this in this interface. So if you want to view the event graph, you can press on this one. If you want to view the correlation graph, you can press on this one. If you want to see the attack matrix, the event reports, uh, the timeline that we'll also see in a, in a second, you can click on this toggle button. Uh, ooh, everything collapsed. <laughs> so now you can see when, when I reload the page, the graph is uh, automatically uh, created. Uh, but I would prefer to have it like always, to have the nodes always at the same location. So something like this, let's say. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is to rearrange the nodes. Get rid of these two. And then I can save the state of my graph. So I add a name. Now I have my state saved. And if later on I want to, to view this graph again, or someone from another organization want to view this graph, uh, uh, the user can go in history and then reload the graph. Um, so for this small graph, maybe it doesn't really make sense to save it, but if you have a graph with 20 nodes and you start to like cluster things, uh, it can really bring value to, to save a state. Okay, uh, so the timeline, quickly, let's quickly go over the timeline. So we can see uh, we have some objects and the attributes that are containing the event. They are set to a specific date, date time, sorry. That is because we don't, uh, we haven't provided uh, a time for these for these entities. So as we haven't, uh, it's using the 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 date time at which uh, they were created. Uh, so this is why we have this red border around them. Uh, but what we can do is to 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 specify it. So if we want to say um, that this. Uh, file was first seen yesterday at, uh, I don't know, let's not provide a, a time. I can hit submit, verify that we have the first in set, update the object. And now if I go back to my timeline, you can see that poof, I don't have the red border anymore. And what I can do is I can also ask MISP to uh, hide all objects that don't have a first in or last in set. Uh, so what you can also do is to provide uh, a first in and a last in. So we can say that it's two days ago and uh, until, I don't know, today. Uh, let's not provide a time. If you update the object, check again the timeline. Now, instead of having just one single point, we have a date range. Uh, and this we can also edit, uh, edit this, uh, this first in a last in data point on the widget itself. So if you want to, to like set a first in on this one, you can just drag and drop it. Uh, same for that person. Uh, if you want to reduce the, the window, we can do something like this, just schedule it. You see, it's pretty easy to, to, to do it. But if you want to be more precise, you can always edit and change manually this first in the last in data point. Okay. Um, so we are almost done. Um, just something that I wanted to, to mention because I think it's really important. We've added context on the event, but we still haven't added context on the attribute. And I think it's really important to also add it because when you are viewing that table or when you are extracting information, uh, being able to be precise to extract only what you want to extract or to viewing which uh, binary is responsible for, uh, uh, for a specific behavior 
is really valuable information. For example, we know that this malicious dot is not performing automated exfiltration, but we know that this this is not malicious binary is doing the autom automated exfiltration. So what we could do is to add this information on the attribute itself. So my attack, and I could say automated exfiltration. Uh, I could even put it on all file hashes. So instead of clicking each time on these ones, I can multi-select it, click on this icon, and then do the same. Oops. Uh, other type of information that could be useful in addition to just having the technique is also what what part of the attacker infrastructure is this attribute about? Um, so we know that this one is the hard coded C2. So what we could say is that this one, and for that I will use another taxonomy called the adversary taxonomy. And we could say that this uh, this URL is uh, being hosted on a server that is of type C2. And so when you export your data, you could export all uh, URLs that uh, uh, are doing some C2 uh, activities. So you can see the, the kind of value that you could bring if you, if you take the time to actually encode this information on attribute level. Last but not least, and then I'm done with the context, I've added an attribute there, the, that CV. But MISP also offers a way to enrich the data you encode. So if I click on this small magnifying glass, it will show, show us uh, in this uh, pop-up uh, information about that CV using the CV advanced enrichment module. If I want to save this information in the event, I can click on this add enrichment button, pick the module that I want to use to perform the enrichment. And then I get a page where I can review what is about to be saved. Can hit submit. And if I reload, I have information about the vulnerability, so the CV. And the cool thing is, it, it also created a link, uh, a relationship between these two. No report because we've seen how to encode object attribute and so on. But if you if you have a bit of time to spare, you can also explain uh, with text for the next analyst or for your colleagues what this incident is about. Uh, so you have multiple ways to create re uh, event report. You can import from a specific URL if you want to describe a blog post. Uh, you can generate it automatically from the event. But in our case, we just want to describe the step and what actually happened. So for that, you can click on Add Event. Uh, then you have to give a name to that event report. So what could we use for this one? Um, I could in in include the original source, original source of the event, and restrict the distribution to only my organization. And then I can paste the whole mail. Now, what we have is an event report that is only visible to our organization. And if I click on it, I have the content. So MISP also includes an editor on which you can do markdown formatting. So if you want, we can also do something like this. Uh, we can also obviously bold things. Uh, if you want to put it in bold, see, it's, it's full markdown. Uh, but we can also include reference to existing object that we have. So instead of keeping this throwaway mail provider raw text value, what we can could do is to uh, the reference to an object. Uh, in this case, it was uh, the throwaway mail provider. And you see, we have a specific syntax that allows you to, to add this reference. So when you save it, you can later on have this interactive report on which you can click, uh, where is it? On which you can click and view more information about it. So this is working for object attributes, but it's also working on tags, so if you want to reference that uh, this is about TLP Ember, well, you can also do it. 
Okay. So I think I've covered like a lot of different aspects. Um, I don't see anything else that we. Yeah, there, there are some interesting questions that I'm answering, but I think they are even mm -hmm. I think interesting for everyone and maybe for the recording too. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, when to select for an object or an attribute. Um, so this question I think is quite important. Um, and I think the, the practice nowadays is, in any case, is to use objects. Uh, I would say that attributes alone are just, I would say, edge cases. Um, the, the reason behind and why it's important to use objects, there are many reasons. Uh, one is obviously the context that you want to uh, keep. I mean, if you have an IP and a port together, it's obvious, obviously you want to keep those contexts together. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but in addition to that, you have a lot additional more information like timestamp that you want on the object and so on are also important, comments, uh, contextual information and so on. Um, in addition to that, it's building relationship and graph. Uh, if you have object, it's easier. You can make the connection between each object and so on. So, uh, I mean, 10 years ago in MISP, a lot of people were just putting attributes. But nowadays, I would say attributes are kind of edge case. Try to avoid those and create an um, uh, object. Um, there, there, were, there were other questions um, regarding um, uh, object too. So if you, for example, rely on sticks export and stuff like that, if you use object, it's much more easier uh, because it's a mapping uh, of object between um, MISP standard format and the uh, sticks 2.1 format. For example, we we basically have a complete mapping documentation. So I can paste it in the chat later on. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty uh, pretty straightforward. But usually use object. Um, there were another question that I yes uh, about correlation, and this one is interesting too. Um, very often in a CSIRT or in a SOC or whatever, when you do trade intelligence and so on, you receive some information from third parties, either automatically, manually, and so on. But you want to know quickly if you know about these informations. Um, there's a quick trick that Sami can show about the free text import, which is basically just importing in the free text to quickly see if you have correlations. That's one way to do it. Uh, you can do it through the uh, even report too, if you want to do the extractions. Uh, so that that's one way of doing it. So the question from CC, um, that's uh, one of the way to do it. This is exposed through the API too. So you can even use that if you don't want to use a user interface, directly do it from MISP uh, through the API. You see that uh, Sami was, he just did it. He created uh, from the free text import. Free text import is doing an automatic extraction of what's our potential attributes. And then you see the similar attribute. And you see this one, why it's not interesting to import it. We have already plenty of of events with those uh, kind of information and so on it doesn't make sense. But this is exposed to the API too. So you can even use that uh, for pre-validating data and so on. There are other advanced models. Uh, I was mentioning that is a caching of MISP instances. So if you, for example, have like other MISP instances, you don't want to import all their data, that's fine, that's fine too. What you can do is to cache the data. So what it means, it's when you add data into your MISP instance, automatically will tell you, oh, we have a correlation on that remote MISP instance. So you don't see actually the relationship and so on, but you just see that there's a correlation. And it's a quick way to see actual correlations with additional feeds and so on. So for example, some organizations, they have two MISP instances. One is more their, I would say, manual investigations, ongoing investigations, their analyst workbench. And they link to another MISP instance, which is basically gathering all the feet. We had these questions from uh, from from different uh, people about, okay, what do we do with all those feeds and so on? It's, it's it's difficult to manage and so on. I have a dedicated MISP instance for it. Uh, it's easier to manage and so on. Um, we had some question about the value, how long it, it uh, the attributes, how long it stays instance and so on. How can we delete those data and so on? We won't dig into the details, but in the chat, I, I, I paste um, information about a feature that we have in MISP called decaying indicators, which basically allow to decay those indicators. And the nice thing with that, uh, you can automatically see uh, that. And we have even a decaying example uh, that uh, Sam is currently showing in the training uh, instance, where you can basically see uh, the different decaying models. And you can use that decaying models to delete data if you want. That's fine. But the decaying model by itself is not deleting uh, data. We had a very nice suggestion of someone, maybe that would be a workflow. That could be too. 
we have a workflow, we have the decaying values. Um, I'm sure Sam is a, the, the one that is a, a freak about workflow, so uh, he, he might be uh, looking into it uh, um, and so on so during the session of this afternoon. So um, that was a very good question. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to, to see the kind of uh, active uh, feedback from the different people there. Um, it's, it's really showing that people thought about different problems and so on, which is great. Um, so um, uh, if you have any other thing that you can continue to ask in the chat and so on, uh, feel free. Um, another thing is we will keep open the mistraining instance. So if you want to just have a look at it, um, look at, for example, the event that Sammy did. We have some example events that are there in the uh, trainings um, materials. Um, so some are interesting too and so on. Um, some are really bound to specific example like the timeline, some are more like for the graph and so on. So here you can see how you can use MISP. Um, for the session of today, it will be hard for us to go into all the features that we have. Um, but this one is a good example of, of the timeline usage. Um, so this one is coming from um, Dirty um, the um, uh, movies. And you can see that, for example, we encoded persons, uh, time when the uh, um, uh, uh, main actors see those person, um, the names uh, within the relationship between this person and the vehicles and so on. Um, and you can create a relationship out of it and so on. So it's, 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 it's basic example just to show. And I think it's it's not limited to anything. I think the only limit is your imaginations. Um, but technically with MISP, you can really express a lot of information. So we had a lot of question about forensic. Um, so yes, indeed, you can ingest data from forensic tools into MISP. Uh, and what we try to do is to have more connectors with other forensic uh, tools. We were mentioning time sketch. There's a huge pull request right now going on on, on time sketch uh, to basically have lookup from time sketch to MISP. Maybe Sammy, you want to show some other stuff? Uh, no, I was just showing live uh, based on the question we had because MISP can export in a variety of format, but it can also import on on some other format like uh, CSV, text, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, for other complex type of formats, such as sticks or PDF and so on, we have dedicated importers in the MISP module uh, enrichment service. Uh, yeah. So if you, if, you want, if you want us to talk a bit more about that, we can do it like after today's session. Because uh, otherwise we, we might run out of time. What I propose now is, uh, as we are like in between, we can do like a small break so that then we can switch on the best practices when we encode event and then to the trend landscaping reporting. So oh, back at 11.10. Perfect. Okay. So see you everyone in 10 minutes. So welcome back, everyone. Um, so um, just to uh, maybe answer a question that we had with validation, and this one is a very good question, um, regarding the different validation level in, in, in MISP for attributes. Um, so there are two strategies in MISP for validation. There are what we call strict validations and soft validations. Um, and I'll explain why it's like that. Um, so the, the strict validations is, I would say, quite obvious. I mean, uh, for example, if you have an MD5 value, we will double check that the MD5 exact decimal representation is correct. Um, so like that, we avoid that people are entering SHA-1 instead of MD5 and stuff like that. Um, so we have a strict validation. So that means MISP will not allow the inclusion of the data into, into the systems. So it's, it's strictly validated. That's one thing. So it's depending on the type, and we do the strict validation. Then, for some times, we do what we call soft validations. Um, so what is soft validations? Um, it's basically telling the user through the user interface that the validation is incorrect. It's not matching. But we still allow to add the attributes inside MISP. I'll explain the use case for that. And um, there are some security background out of it. For example, Banking details like iBank accounts are soft validated. The reason being is the following. Um, there were some attackers that were basically triggering some uh, financial systems by entering wrong IBAN values. Uh, so it means this can be used as an indicator. Um, even if the IBAN is invalid, 
it might have an impact on uh, security infrastructures and so on. So that's why we have this model of soft validations. Um, so one was mentioning about uh, uh, cryptocurrency uh, addresses, and it's exactly the same. Um, nevertheless, if you have expansion services uh, in MISP, they can do additional validation. So that means you can enter data into MISP, but when you use a validation, they might complain that, for example, this cryptocurrency or Bitcoin addresses is incorrect, which makes sense because then they do strict, strict validations. So it's something to keep in mind. In, in MISP, you have um, strict validations and so validations. Uh, if I recall correctly, Sami paste in the chat uh, the link in the code for the financial validations uh, as an example, uh, where the validation is going for. True, as usual, every validation is based on uh, regular expressions, um, which might generate and being a source of problems sometimes, but uh, it's all we do validation. So if you see some incorrect validation issue there and so on, don't hesitate to report it back to us. Uh, but we have a kind of exhaustive uh, set of validations models in, in MISP. It's kind of usually sometimes for some validations is a kind of, I would say, balance between usability, uh, sharing of data and, and validation. So there's no strict validations. For example, we had a very often discussion about URLs validations. Um, we don't do strict validation on URLs uh, due to the fact that URLs have plenty of format and attackers are even abusing that format uh, to perform uh, some uh, some activities and, and so on. So just a kind of quick summary, but I think it would, would be interesting to have it recorded because uh, sometimes we have questions about uh, validations. Okay. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, can you see my screen? Oh, awesome, perfect. All right. Uh, so yeah, as, as Alex uh, was mentioning validation, I was showing that uh, if MISP detects that a specific value doesn't validate, for example, for this IBAN number, it shows a warning, but it still allows you to, to add that. Uh, but if you try to like create uh, if you try to create an attribute where its type is strictly validated, like, I don't know, an IP, MISP will not be happy and will not let you proceed. So we have this uh, strict uh, checking and uh, soft checking it. Okay, so now let's see some best practices um, when encoding train intelligence uh, report. And <clears throat> you will see that uh, most, of, uh, most of these best practices have already been mentioned, but I think it's a good to, to recapitulate and to, uh, to have it like on slides. So for that, I will use this wonderful document about some commitment uh, that are always good to follow when you encode train intelligence. So, this, this slide deck uh, has been uh, built from mainly from this uh, source. Uh, so feel free to check it out as well. So the first one is about... So is there a... Is there questions? Some someone is not new to it. Um, just... yep. mm. All good, go on, thanks. Okay. All right. So it was about event creation. Um, so the first thing I think is would be to use English, um, especially if you think that uh, the information you're ranking might be shared with other people, partners, and so on that don't really speak your uh, uh, the language. Uh, it's not a requirement, obviously, but as this text this event info text is visible on the event index uh, and it's meant for human, obviously. Uh, it's good to have it in English. So to have it concise, self-explanatory as we did for the spear phishing example. And if it's, it's even better if it's in English. Then it's, the second uh, point is to cluster the data properly. What I mean by that, and it's pretty obvious once you understand how we structure the data. So you know we have this attribute and object and they all belong to event. Uh, what I mean by that is don't create one event that would hold all the information because that is not helpful for anyone. Um, so group and create event according to 
what you want to express. If it is an incident, create an event. If it is a blog post describing a specific type of malware, create an event. If you want to have like daily dump uh, of uh, Onipot uh, or sandbox execution, create an event for each execution or even better if it has a lot of data for each day, for example. Uh, and the last point is to take time to properly encode your data. Uh, we know that it's really time consuming to encode uh, correctly, to add all the context, to add all the tags and so on. But I mean, the information that you can extract out of it after what is so valuable that I think it's really worth the time to, to properly encode it. And once you start to understand how you should do the encoding, then you can start to automate things to make it easier. I showed you an example, for example, for the URL, where you just paste a list of URL and then it creates object out of it. You could do, do that for other type of object, and you could even do that for contextualization as well. So yeah, if you get used to that, then you can speed, speed up the, the, this work. The second aspect is, and I think it also replies to one of the questions we had earlier, to prefer the usage of object uh, rather than using attributes. The first, the first reason is because you make things more readable. Imagine, let's go back to our original event. Imagine if instead of having this file, and where is the, the other file? Quickly put it on top. Imagine if we had these two files. No, oh, it's not on top. Anyway, uh, that were not where the attribute would not be contained in the object. In the event, you would have a table with two MD5 file hash, two SHA1 and two SHA256. And you wouldn't know to which object or to which uh, uh, malware sample this file hash belongs to. So it would be like uh, really tough to, to understand what is linked to what. So for that specific case, uh, I think it's always a safe bet to use object. Second point that uh, is really cool that you have when you are using object is that you can create relationship. You may not have uh, realized it, but when you are encoding these, uh, these graphs, you can create a relation from an object to an attribute, from an object to an object, but you cannot do it from an attribute to anything else. So yeah, if you use object, you can create these relationships. Uh, and the last point is uh, it gives you more freedom because we have a set of object template that is available, but if you need to express something that is not there or that is not supported by default by MISP, you can always create that uh, object template for your use case. Example includes uh, a car. You could express a car. Uh, you could express a plane. You could express uh, uh, weather forecast, we know some people are doing that. Uh, Radar uh, signatures and so on. We know people doing that. So yeah, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, the third point is to review the IDS and correlation flags. This is something that we haven't really do so far. Uh, but when you encode information, you see you have this IDS and correlation flag. Uh, correlation, oh, this is not my event. <laughs> oh, so people actually try to encode the event today. Cool. Cool to see. All right, so back to my event. So you have the correlation and the IDS flag. So you see some value correlates, uh, but you can choose, uh, you can force them to correlate. For example, it would be not really a good idea to correlate on HTTPS, but you can also choose not to correlate on some value. For example, the domain there, you could choose not to correlate. And the IDS flag, remember the IDS flag, distinguish between an, uh, an indicator of compromise and an observable, or more generally speaking, if you set the IDS flag, that means that this attribute should be fed to your protective tool. If it's not set, don't feed it to your protective tool. So checking, for example, this, this flag, this IDS flag on HTTPS would be a really bad idea because you would indicate that any URL with the HTTPS scheme should be blocked. 
uh, while setting this IDS flag on that URL means I want my SIEM or IDS system or whatever to block or report any access to that URL. So yeah, take time to review correlation if you want to force correlation or if you want to ignore correlation, but also the IDS status. The fourth point is about contextualization. I think we already talked a lot about it. Uh, so just a few remarks. If you contextualize the event, the attribute and object gets its context automatically. You will see that during the thread report uh, session. Uh, but yeah, so if you tag an event with, uh, in our case, it was with PEP or with TLP, that means all attributes will benefit from that tag. You don't have to add this tag. Um, yeah, we also saw that it is possible to add the context to the attribute themselves. And this is great to discover, for example, C2 server, exfiltration, technique used, and so on. It's very valuable reader. And the fourth point, the, the third point on this on this slide uh, is actually a, a point about a question that was asked at the very beginning of the session uh, about which taxonomy in Galaxy to use. And for this one, uh, you have to, to agree beforehand with the community on which you, you are creating the data for. Um, if you are like having time constraint when you are encode your data, but you still want to do contextualization, I would focus on these five uh, five aspects. So to describe to whom uh, can this data be releasable, what can they do with the data, if it is about an incident, what type of tactics and techniques did the attacker use? Uh, is it an incident? Is it a, a monthly report? Is it a, a malware sandbox execution? Uh, if you are dealing with malware, what type of malware, what type of ma malware family is it, and so on. Uh, the, the fifth point is about adding timeliness to your data. Uh, so if you set the first in or last in, first of all, you would get automatic, automatic timeline. So we saw that. Um, but, and I think this is the most valuable point, is that you can uh, use the lifecycle management system in MISP to perform uh, IOC decaying. So we are not we are not going to talk about that today. But if you set this time component, MISP can rely on this data point to perform lifecycle management of of your information. Six point is check the warning exits, and you see. I completely forgot about that point. So even I am I'm not totally following the commandment. So let's quickly have a look at this. Um, so let's add an attribute that I know is an obviously false positive. So I've added 8888, which is uh, a public DNS uh, server, resolver of Google. And you can see I have a small warning. And if I go on the top of the event, I have another warning saying that we have some potential false positive in our event. One of the attributes belong to a list of IPv4 public DNS resolvers. And if we hover on this uh, triangle, we we see that uh, uh, this uh, has a hit on our warning list. So the reason why we have a warning is because we have added an attribute that belongs to this list, but this attribute has the IDS flag set, which means we want to feed this IP address to our protective tool and potentially block it. But as, a, as it is a public DNS resolver, I'm not sure if it's really interesting to block that information. So if we uncheck this IDS flag, and then we can reload the page, we can see that the warning goes away and same for the attribute. So always review, uh, if you have some warning hits, uh, it can really uh, be a disaster, especially if you if you push some, uh, if you, for example, I don't know, uh, block your entire infrastructure or uh, blacklist your IP ranges, stuff like that, can make some people happy. Uh, not happy, sorry. Okay, another point is to write a small event report. So 
to do a small write-up. So for example, to write an executive summary of what happened. Uh, this is especially true when you didn't take the time to encode the relationship between your object. If you did, maybe it's uh, sufficient that you don't really need the event report. Uh, if you didn't, I think having a small write-up explaining what this event is about, uh, what this incident is about, how did the attacker uh, uh, had access to that system, stuff like that, I think is really valuable for your analyst and incident responder. And the last point is to review the distribution and publisher event. So reviewing the distribution, we more or less did it during the encoding part, where we choose, for example, not to release a specific attribute to everyone. Remember, it was with the, uh, yeah, that information, teacher of the CEO's daughter. Remember, we set it as a lower distribution level. Uh, so this is part of the review, the distribution of your information. And once you think that everything is good, uh, or is at least sufficient for you and potentially your partner to use inf that information to protect themselves, then you need to publish your event. If you don't publish it, it may it will not be synchronized, uh, and it may not be ex uh, exported in some export format. For example, uh, some SIM rules or uh, IDS rules that you can generate out of your MISP data uh, will not include the attributes if the event is not published. And to publish it is fairly simple. You click on Publish Event uh, and just yes. If you click on yes, then the event will be published. The job has been queued and if we reload, then we see that the event has been published. And that's basically it for the best practices. <laughs> so that's good. We have like 30 minutes now to talk about threat landscape. Yeah, well, side, a side, side note, the slide deck will be available in the this training uh, directory because I think it's not there, this one. So. Um, maybe not. You're, yeah. you're right, maybe not. So the question from... Uh, uh, from, from Stefan or someone else. So I think it's, it's good that we, 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 I think we forgot to even put it, so that's great. Uh, so Alex, would you like to, to take over yeah, to describe uh, the, the few questions that you usually ask yourself yeah. when you generate? Yeah, sure. And then uh, we, you can go for the examples. Yes. Um, so if you go to the, maybe the hashtag for that, so yeah, so that's great. Um, Okay, so this section here, it's, it's, it's kind of, I would say, bonus of the, of the session of today, um, because it's a problem that everyone is facing. I mean, I, I'm facing it. I have my uh, ministries, management, whatever, asking me to make a trade landscape report, do a trade landscape report. Or sometimes they have some very, very specific questions that are like, for example, a, a question about um, a specific topic that they want to, uh, to tackle, is, for example, this country much more active than the other countries and so on. So based on that, uh, over the year, what we have seen is basically MISP is an incredible source of information. And you can use that information to really build very good trade landscape report based on reality. Uh, so it's not coming from, it could come from news and so on, but it comes from from people sharing real incidents, real information, so things that they, they have seen and so on. So it could generate very high quality report based on these actual information. So usually the, the, the most common question that we have, and it's, it's quite interesting there, it's, I think the majority of questions that we have can be answered from a MISP instance with, a, an, a, I would say, enough information there and the contextualization. And I really thank Sami to show back these eight commandments because it's super important regarding uh, how to produce information, even it's a bit tiresome at the beginning and seeing all the way to do it and so on. Uh, but if you start to be used to it in a team, I mean, adding contextualization make, make a lot of sense. So the most common question that we receive usually for trade reporting as a, as a one, I try to summarize those, maybe there are some more specific ones, but it's just more specific one, uh, more general one that I, I mentioned that. It's, for example, what are the most common vulnerabilities? So, or are they abused or often? Uh, from, for example, which countries, things like that. Is it something that we have seen just one time? Is it a recurring cases? Um, do we see which kind of vulnerability from action that is most exposed and most used? 
Um, and exactly the same for any traits, for example, or techniques used by adversaries. Um, Sami showed during uh, the encoding that he was using attack matrix. It's full of techniques from the attacker and so on. And by using that, it's great because when you start to have techniques of attackers, it's not only to find out about the techniques, but if if you know a bit the attack model, uh, you basically know that there's a, a way to find back the remediations for each of the techniques. And by doing so, you know which kind of at least priorities or thing that you need to do for remediations to limit the specific risk. And uh, we recently uh, published a report in Luxembourg for uh, uh, Thread. And the thing is, we basically use all MISP instances to generate what are the most commonly uh, technique or remediation technique that could limit the risk. Um, at the end of the text, you have a, a report. Uh, it's, not, it's not this one. It's the, this one is from Tiber. Uh, it's the last one. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this one is, is uh, the report that we, we generated. And the majority of the data that is coming in this report are coming from uh, MISP instances. And if you go in the, around the end of the report, um, I will talk back about the others, but uh, we have uh, here the priorities for my risk mitigation. This is coming from MISP. Uh, we didn't uh, do a lot of work there. It's, it's basically automatic. So we decided, okay, I want to have the scope in Luxembourg of specific events and so on. And I want this uh, being extracted. Um, Sami will show a functionality that we have in, in MISP uh, called the uh, periodic reporting, uh, which basically helping to do that. The second part, and this one is a vulnerability one that uh, uh, Sami is showing there, this one is coming from MISP2. It's based on object of vulnerabilities that are uh, used, and we use the first scene and last scene timestamp. It's straightforward. If you know the first scene and the last scene, you know how long the vulnerability is exposed. And there you can directly spot that, uh, for example, the exchange vulnerability is still something that we have to face because there are still unpatched exchange or things that are popping back and so on. That's based on this data. And you see, for example, that some specific ex ex uh, vulnerabilities were used like a very short time of, 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 of the thing. So it's it's basically coming from actual missed data, and this is automatically generated. For example, I'm generating that graph from MISP to Mermaid in Markdown and from Mermaid to uh, a PNG uh, export. So that's basically the, the format there. And it's straightforward and you can really do it. Uh, and for us, why we do that, it's really saving time. Initially, we were like collecting left and right things, people putting back data into uh, Excel sheet and so on. And uh, even if Excel is still one of the most commonly used tool in trade intelligence, I mean, sometimes you want to basically uh, fast and, uh, faster your, your, um, your analysis. So the idea behind is, Okay, if we can automate and generate documentation automatically, we do it. So if we go back to the questions, um, what we, we can see that we have additional questions like countries targeted. Um, Sami show in the example of the emails that uh, he use uh, Galaxy with uh, targets, which is basically setting countries. So there, if you start to add this information, you have it for your report. Um, you have malware families, exactly the same. So if you use a specific um, um, classification like Malpedia and other that are available as galaxies in MISP, you have it and you can do it in the report. But there's a collateral thing that is interesting with MISP. There is not only the contextualized information, which is great for doing the threat reporting, there are additional information that you can even deduce or extract from the MISP instance. For example, with sharing, because MISP has this functionality of sharing, you can create organizations, have those organizations sharing information, and so on, you can do statistics on that. And you can even see how active they are, how active are some organizations. And you can even limit to specific organizations. You can even limit to some sector of activities to define, okay, this group is sharing more than this group and so on. And on top of that, and which is very interesting, is more you share information about specific, for example, um, information that you collect. And by acting like that, you can even deduce the capabilities of organizations. So for example, an organization sharing details about, I don't know, specific memory analysis, you know that they have these capabilities. And by looking at what kind of information is shared, type of object, uh, maybe type of attribute, uh, what kind of tax they use and so on, you can even deduce capabilities. So it's even for your trade reporting, if you do internal trade report for NISAX and so on, by looking at all the misinformation is shared and so on, you can really build 
uh, reporting, not only on the trend landscape, but on the information sharing practices that are taking place into your sharing community, which is quite, quite interesting. So technically, obviously, MISP is not replacing a, uh, an analyst doing the work, or, but it's really a support tool. Uh, if he has to produce report and so on, you want to make it easy and, and, and more faster and so on. Um, we had the questions previously about um, uh, things that you can search for and so on. And for example, in the periodic reporting, you can do filter and you can apply the filter from the research there and you can limit your result and the search. Uh, someone was asking for attack matrix. Can we have an attack matrix for specific organizations? Yes, you can do it. So you can se select a specific organizations and I think that we will go no deeper in that approach, which Sami will show you some example of how to do it. Uh, and it, it's not completely exhaustive, so it's, it will show you all the entry points. But for example, the open API uh, for the research that is described is a good source of, 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 of information, or you can use it and so on. So that's interesting there, because it's, 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 uh, it's really, we try to always reproduce that model. So you have plenty of functionality in MISP, but if you can apply um, the research, for example, and you know about it, you can apply all those filters at various places in this. But I'll let uh, Sami play and, and show to you uh, all those functionalities. Okay, so I will. And for that, we will go from the easiest to the hardest. Um, and I will start with the easiest. So how to like create or at least get the data to create this threat report. So easiest means using the user interface, obviously. Um, so let's go back uh, to our event. Let's say this one. And if you want to create a small report out of the data you created, you can use the event report feature and especially use the generate report from event. There, you can specify some filtering uh, if you want to only include some specific uh, attributes and so on. Um, and then you can uh, request additional stuff. And if you click on this, then you can see what was generated. So see, it's pretty basic. Just add a bit of information about the event, the tag that were used, the galaxy that were used, uh, the object, some attributes. You can choose to remove them or not, and the heat map. And that you can, after a while, if we view it, you can then choose to download it as PDF or uh, whatever. So this is the easiest one. So now for a thread reporting uh, of a landscape reporting, uh, what you could do is to create one event, encode the data and the context that you want, and then use this small, uh, uh, this small tool, generate fr report from event to generate it. I mean, it's a start. It's not perfect, but at least it can be helpful. And you can see how easy it is. But maybe you want to have something more interesting. Not about one event, but about, but about aggregation of data that, that was created on your instance. And for that, we have created a new feature that is like two or three months old, which is called the Miss Periodic Reporting. So if from the events index, you click on view periodic summary, it will give you a summary of the data that you have on your MISP instance. So let's quickly have a look. We have a summary payload. We have a daily summary. So this is only for today. You can see that only one event was published today. So this is the event that I published. The other people that created the event didn't publish the event. So that's why it's not included. Um, attribute, you see number of attributes, number of objects, blah, blah, blah. Then you see the top 10 Mitre attack technique. See, it's already interesting. Top 10 attribute type. You see the event report that were created. You see the tag that were added. So the top 10 tags for today. Some information about the event. And then some trendings on tags. So it's, we don't have data from the 12th and the th uh, 13th. So we don't have this uh, line chart, uh, but at least you see that you can have some trendings. A summary of all the contexts that were added. The classical uh, matrix. 
and at the end security recommendation where based on all the information all the context that were added we can derive security recommendation including preventive measures to prevent your organization against this kind of attack and also the mitigation that you can put in place so this is just for one day i'm not sure if you have more data for weekly no we don't maybe monthly so you see monthly we have a bit more uh, so at least you, you can see how it looks like so unfortunately we don't have uh, attack tag so we can't see uh, but yeah you get the idea so for that uh, you can see extremely easy to 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 get these you just click on view periodic summary uh, now you can also configure it to only show a subset of the data so if you go on periodic summary setting then you have an interface where you can choose okay i want to have a periodic summary for the training organization that only includes uh well data under the disk unity only distribution setting so in this case yep we can uh can skip it event info you can also request it you can also specify which tags you want the event to have in order to to be displayed so in our case let's say that we want to have a report only for tlp ember uh, yeah and then you can also specify the report to, to compute to generate trending for the specify tag namespaces uh, yeah click, click submit then you have set your periodic summary settings and now if we go back to this page uh, you can see the settings under which that report was generated and if we go back there you can see that we only include uh, about tlp ember data uh, yeah, so you, you even see the state uh, yeah. so that was the, the second way on how you can do it uh, configure your setting and then have a look at this interface um, a third thing that you can do is to use the MISP built-in dashboard. Uh, so, if you click on dashboard, you can have a dashboard uh, based on all the data that you have on your MISP instance. So this dashboard, you can have many of them. So you can create your dashboard, you can save its uh, configuration, and then you can share this configuration with other users of your instance, but also users for other MISP instances. Um, and you can quickly switch between the different dashboards. So for this one, let's say that I want to save it. Uh, we'll call it my dashboard one. I can set multiple things for that dashboard, but the purpose is not to have a in-depth look of how, what you can do and you can pivot from this dashboard to another one so for example the admin dashboard this is not really interesting for thread landscape reporting but if you are an administrator of that misp instance you can see some diagnostics about your misp instance and then if you want to go back to your thread landscape dashboard you can quickly pivot and see uh, who share the data over time uh, some event stream based on uh, yeah, there are no like filtering, but you could add some filters on that uh, list of events. Uh, some tags that are really popular on this instance, the top five uh, Maitre attack uh, technique that were used. Um, so see, I added a threshold, added uh, uh, filtering on a specific galaxy, and then I can derive that kind of widget. Um, so it's fairly easy to to use you can create new widget by clicking the add widget uh, and then yeah you have multiple widgets available so let's take for example the one for tags what is it trending tags and then you can pass a configuration so if you want to say okay i only want to see uh stat about uh the and the tlp seems correct you can submit and poof uh, didn't really work maybe i messed up with the uh, so if i see maybe i messed up with the thing but you can uh yeah this will take uh 
all the, the tags, all the tags that are attached to event that have the TLP. So we can drag and drop them and so on. So yeah, this is this can be useful if you set them up correctly, then you can have a view and you can take a screenshot of that interface. But I think the, the most common way for you to generate trend landscape report is to actually export the data out of WISP, uh, then aggregate them manually using either scripting or different tools, and then generate uh, well your trend report. And for that, what you would usually use is to use the MISP API. So for that, I have prepared um, a small Jupyter notebook that we will share uh, later today uh, that guides you through the different things that you can do with the MISP API and to show you the kind of data that you can export. Um, so the first thing is to interact with the MISP API, you have to get an API key. So to do that, you can go on global action, my profile, and then out key, and then you can generate a new authentication key. It gets displayed on the screen. And after that, you can use it. So let's uh, let's execute this one. Let's do the import. You can collect an event, obviously, from uh, from this. Uh, as as you may have noticed, this is Python. So MISP, you can either interact with MISP using the uh, like REST API using HTTP, yes. um, or you can use PyMISP, which is a Python library that, that can act as a client to interact with MISP. So we can collect an event. Uh, so see, I've collected an event by its UID. Uh, yeah, so if you put the Python defined there, it will cast the, re the reply from MISP into a, uh, a Python MISP event object. If you don't, it's simply a dictionary that you can interact with. Just, just so, so you know what this Python defined means. Uh, so the first thing that you can do to extract data is to filter or to search the event index. What I mean by event index is this interface. This is the event index. So for this one, searching the event index and I'm taking the first result, well, the second because it's zero indexed and getting the UID. You can also ask to, to only get events that have been published. And I think when you generate thread landscape report, it's a good practice to request the event to be published. Because if the event is not published, maybe it's not done. Maybe it's still a draft. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you, it's better to have them published because usually when people publish something, it means they are in a completed state. So yeah, just passing published and then you have it. Then you can play with time. So we have multiple data point on which you can play when you want to extract information. For event, you have what we call the timestamp and what we call the published timestamp. So if we pivot back to our original one, you see you have the, the, the timestamp which is not displayed. Ah, there it is. We have this one. So this is a timestamp. So the time at which that event was last changed. And if I take a published event, we have the published timestamp, which is the timestamp at which the event was last published. So depending on the which data point you want to have, uh, you would use either timestamp or published timestamp. Now for thread landscape reporting, uh, as I mentioned that it should, it should uh, take into account events that have been published, I would use the published timestamp data point a parameter so that you make sure that the event is published and that you get the latest version of that event. All right, so you can do some interesting stuff. So you can pass as a string like this. So to say, okay, I want to have all events uh, that, uh, that was created 
since last month. Or you can use a Python date time, so to say, for example, today, and you uh, remove like 30 days. Oops, there we go. And you see published uh, through publish timestamp. This is uh, 30 days ago. And then I get the results that is this, that are displayed. Okay. So we've been searching the index, so the event index, so this page. But this page only shows us information about the event, basically. So the context and the, the distribution, who created that event, and uh, well, the, this info page, uh, this info column, sorry. Uh, which is already good high level information, especially if you want to do some statistics. For example, statistics about the number of created events about a specific topic, number of created events about a specific organization, um, how organizations are sharing and distributing the data on the wage distribution level, and so on. And if the event is well contextualized, you can also do statistics about the type of incident. So is it an incident? If yes. Is it some phishing? Is it some compromise? Is it, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can even go one step further and do statistics about MITRE attacks. So what kind of techniques and tactics are used? How often and for how long? So yeah. Plenty of interesting stuff. And this is just by querying the event index. So just by querying the high level information of your data. So let's see what we have there. So in this case, um, based on our search on the index, um, we have a lot of properties that we can have a look at. So the UID distribution, publish date, timestamp, uh, the tags, galaxies, and so on. And if we look, for example, at the event tag, there this is what it looks like. So you can see we can get which tag was attached to the event. And if we have some galaxy cluster, we can also view them. But it's not the case for my test data. So some useful parameter that could be interesting for you when you want to extract data. So by parameter, I mean the one that you can path uh, for your uh, search comment. Uh, we'll not go through all of them. I uh, will let you do that as an exercise if you're interested in that uh, when we we'll share the, this notebook. Basically, publish is important. You can also filter the event return based on value of attributes it contains. Uh, some tags can filter on date, obviously. You can filter on distribution level, or organization, and so on. So this was searching on the index. But a more the, the, the most powerful endpoint that we have to search for data is what we call the REST search endpoint. Um, now we have uh, we have like three scope on which you can use the REST search endpoint. You can use the REST search endpoint on event, you can use the REST search endpoint on attribute, and you can use it for object. For this more session, we only have a look at event and attribute. Uh, now, what's the difference between event research and uh, attribute research? Uh, it, they only differ in how the data is returned because they both support the same set of parameters, um, but the way they return the data is slightly different. If you do your search against the event research endpoint, it will return the whole event with uh, its entire uh, child element. So it will return the event, all of its associated attributes, object proposal, tags, event report, and so on. If you do your search against the attribute research, it will only return the attributes. So it, it depends if you want to have the whole context, you would search on the event research. If you want to filter only a specific set of attributes, uh, you, would need, you would do that against the attribute research endpoint. So let's see what we have there. So, See the difference? The dot search using is using REST search endpoint, while the where is it again? Search index is searching against the index. Uh, so right now I'm querying uh, 
the event has search endpoint with the controller event. And by asking the and passing the metadata to true, I'm actually getting the exact same data than the index version because I'm not I'm requesting miss not to include the child element. But the difference with the search index uh, is you have more flexibility on how you filter your data, as you will see. All right, so let's see what you can do with research. Let's see, pretty straightforward. We are using attribute research. We can filter on attribute value. You can filter on the list of value, and you can also use some wild cards. So see the result set for a simple value. We, if we search for 8888, we only have attributes that have 8888 as a value. If we search for that list, uh, we will get attributes that have either 8888 or 5421 as a value, as you can see. And the last one with the wildcard, if you put like the percent character at the end, uh, you can search for substring match. And in this case, it returns us this attribute. You can also search on type. So if you want to extract all Bitcoin addresses, all first name, all malware sample and attachment, you can also do it by passing the parameter type attribute. And now comes the interesting part is to filter your dataset based on tags. So similar to uh, the value, you can pass one single value. So in this case, you would have only one, uh, one tag. Um, or you can pass a list of tags. So for example, there we are uh, requesting all attributes that have pp red or tlp red. And you can see uh, we have 18 attributes that got returned. For example, the third attribute uh, have this list of tags. So it has pp red, adversary infrastructure, exploit distribution point. So you see it has pp red, but it doesn't have tlp red because it's an OR between the two. Now, you see, we can also use wildcard also for tags. So in this case, we would get all uh, attributes that are related, that, that have the target information set. So we can see this is the, the, the tag of all the attributes. And you can see that so we are, I'm just, this is just an attribute that got returned by this search query. And you can see that we don't have a tag MISP Galaxy target information attached to this attribute. Some don't have a tag, and others have only one tag. For example, this one has TLP red, and this one has the tag test foo. And an open question that uh, I would like to ask you, uh, why do you think I don't have the, this tag attached to the attribute? <laughs> because the date, these attributes are returned by this uh, filtering criteria, but they don't have the, the tag attached to them. So why, is, why do we have a result there? And the answer is, it is because the event is actually tagged, not the attribute. And as the attribute inherit the context of the event, you would get them in the result set. So now, if I'm listing, well, this is a a large query. Now, if I'm listing the tag of all events that were returned for all attributes there, you can see that I have the target information included. All right. So what we are going now as a next search is we want to have uh, attributes uh, that have the target information, but where the target was not Luxembourg. So you see, we, we got 17 results, and you can see all the event tag that got returned by this query is Canada, China, and Germany, and it doesn't include Luxembourg. So you see, you can do negation by just uh, adding this exclamation mark character in front of the value that you don't want to include. So we had this information, see, so remember, where we were not having this miss Galaxy target information included. But you can request MISP to include and to propagate the tag from the event onto the attribute. And this is done by just passing the include event tag parameter. So these are the same queries. 
But this one, the second one, asks for the uh, event tag to be also included on attribute. And you can see, tag for the first attribute, we don't have any. But for the, for the second query, we have all the tags that are attached at the event. So it can be also useful for you to attach this tag, uh, event tag to the attribute tag as well. Now, let's have a look on how, to can, how you can build complex queries to extract data. Um, so when you pass a list like this, when you pass a list, you will do an OR operator between these two uh, search values, like this one. So in this case, if we execute this query, we would get all attributes uh, that have either the TLP ember or that are infrastructure type C2. So let's execute this one. See, these, these are the tags of the, a subset of the tag of uh, that amount of attribute that got returned. You can see they only have TLP ember, not this one. But what we could do is to do an is to use an end operator between these two search values. So in this case, we'll search for all attributes that have the TLP tag and that have the infrastructure type C2. And in this case, you can see we only have five results. And if we look at the tag of these attributes, you can see that they all have both tags. So if you need to do end uh, operator between search value, you can use this build complex query instruction. Now you can go even a bit more crazy and search also on the Galaxy cluster metadata. Uh, so this is for the target information. So let's quickly have a look at the target information. Oops. So if I go on Galaxy list, target information. Oops. And let's have a look, for example, on Luxembourg. What do we have? You see that for that cluster, we have um, the official language, and we also have member of NATO. And what you can do is to instruct MISP to collect all events and all attributes where they have a cluster that is member of NATO, that has the member of NATO set, and where the official language is French. So if we execute that query, see we have two events, and this is the first event, this is the second one. So this is obviously true because uh, yeah, official language of Luxembourg is French, one of the official languages at least, and they are member of NATO. And now for this one, you might be wondering, hey, China is not a member of NATO, well, what is that? But we have Canada, and because it is an OR operation between the two, uh, as Canada validate both this filter uh, parameter, uh, the, the event is included. But what you could do then is to also say, hey, I don't want China to be included in my result set, or I don't want to have, uh, uh, if they don't have NATO, then don't include that. This is how you could like express uh, more filtering things. Uh, so some notes about that. Uh, unfortunately, this search query is not supported by PyMISP. That's why I had to use this direct call directive. But for that, I refer you to the PyMISP documentation. Uh, and also something that could be interesting is how to filter data based on the creator organization. So in our case, in this one, I'm asking MISP to return me all the all the events where the creator organization is from Luxembourg and it has it is part of the sector financial. So to, to show you what I mean by that, if I go on my profile, uh, let's see, org name, no, I don't have it. So let's list organization. Let's check training. See, training organization is part of the financial sector on my instance and it has the Luxembourgish nationality. And so by uh, filtering on this data, I can get all the events that were created 
by organizations that have the Luxembourg nationality and the financial sector. So we can see organization nationality, the training organization has the Luxembourgish nationality, the other organization myself don't have a nationality, and the organization for which uh, uh, the event belongs to uh, are all from the training organization. Okay, you are almost done, so bear with me. Um, we also can ask MISP to convert the data to be returned into a different format. Um, if for some reasons you are, if you are already built some thread report landscaping pipeline, to, but this pipeline is based on CSV, you can also ask MISP to return on the CSV format. And to do that, you just have to supply return format and set it to CSV. And then this one displayed all attributes that are either IP source or IP destination, as you can see. Um, MISP also includes some special type of return format. For example, this one is context markdown. Uh, can give it a try. It's similar to what we have when we build the periodic reporting. So this one outputs a markdown, which uh, is about uh, all the context uh, that that has been created for the for the set of event. So in this case, the search criteria is all the events that were created by organization from the financial sector, and then you get the context created by that. Uh, so for this one, we have we are asking for the context return format. Uh, and we are filtering on all events that uh, where the APT29 uh, thread actor is involved. So if I execute this query, I get context output HTML. So I get uh, this file that uh, I save on disk. And now if I preview it, oops, there we go. I have the, the stuff that was created. So as you can see, this is HTML. So we can also ask Smith to output HTML using the context return format. Um, yeah, this is skip it because we are already running out of time. You can search for sightings as well. Uh, and if you are familiar with uh, Panda, I'm not a Panda expert at all, but you can also uh, quite easily do some plotting on the, the data that you got, that you exported. Uh, we'll just quickly show, show it how, what it looks like. I think I need this data to be called. There we go. Um, but yeah, for so this one, just for this one, we, we cast, uh, we transform a timestamp into a date time so that Panda can understand it. Uh, and then you can do some interesting stuff. So for example, seeing the number of attributes uh, of sightings that you have on specific attributes, uh, you can view like, Settings that were created on this particular uh, day, uh, weekday. And this one, I don't remember what that is. Ah, yes, this is hours on the X axis and on the Y axis is just the amount of cycling that were created by hours. Uh, so as you see, it's, it's only one line actually, because this is the one that calculates it, this one prints it, and this one do the plot. So it's actually one line to get that kind of graph. So if you are a bit familiar or you want to invest time in understanding how this can work, um, you can easily create graph quite, quite easy. Whew, that was quite a rush, uh, but feel free to like try this, uh, try this playbook. Uh, it will be made available on the misprinting repository. Yeah, it will be next to the video. So we'll uh, put back next to the video all the uh, material that we use including the updated one for the Jupyter Notebooks. I point to the previous one from PyMISP, uh, but this one has more additional ones, so you, you might uh, uh, use it too. Um, there are a lot of documentation for MISP, so um, we had a lot of questions about where we can find like blueprints, um, stock playbooks, things like that. Um, so there, there's a lot of, of documentation available on the different MISP uh, website, on the MISP training uh, GitHub repositories and so on. 
on the missed training layer, which is for law enforcement, but containing a lot of, of generic examples that can be reused and, and so on. Um, so on the page, we, we have all those materials available. So um, that's interesting for, for everyone. Um, there is, it's quite a lot of documentation because there's a lot of future of MISP and a lot of people are using MISP in different way. Uh, we had a lot of questions regarding integ integrations with existing tools um, like uh, Microsoft Sentinel, Splunk, and so on. Um, so I, I put some, some in the chat with the answers. There's a tool page on the MISP project where we try to list all the integrations, but this one is not exhaustive, but including the default, I would say, known integrations. If you know some others, feel free to contribute. Um, that's, uh, I think, the, the most common thing. So if you are new to... Oh, Alex, you got muted. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so uh, if uh, MISP is a big beast, so you, you might, uh, at the beginning, see how there's a lot of functionalities and so on. Indeed. Um, so if you have to focus on specific aspects and so on, read a specific slide deck uh, regarding that. For example, a lot of discussion about decaying of indicators, deleting of all data and so on uh, pop up. Maybe we'll do, do a session regarding that um, because I think it would be an interesting topic to uh, to cover. Uh, so that's why we like to have those kind of interactions because we discover maybe topics that are maybe obvious for us, but not very obvious for everyone. So uh, that's maybe something that we can uh, do, dig into it. Uh, just to, to, to conclude on the uh, thread intelligence report, how to produce those final reports and so on uh, and to leverage that part, we use a lot of Pandoc. Um, so Sami show very interesting functionality into the context markdown that you can get out of the rest search. Um, it's nice building blocks to generate a markdown document later on. Uh, so for example, we use Pandoc quite a lot. And as an example, uh, below you have a link there uh, with the LaTeX template for Pandoc, um, which is very interesting because this one is uh, producing quite of high quality report uh, using LaTeX. Um, and you can do all the full chain with that. Uh, automatically so that's very very nifty uh, and useful for uh, all the users so we will put back all the informations uh, on uh, on the website next to the video so like that the people that could attend today could even dig more into the materials and so on and for the new one that are just watching the video and so on they can uh, have a look at it uh, anyway i would like to thanks everyone that participated today that was a, a very interesting one uh, so we, we hope that you enjoy it. And if you have any feedback and so on, don't hesitate to uh, send us feedback, follow our Mastodon account, or to, um, for example, open issue on GitHub, uh, or, or to go on our GitHub Matrix uh, chat uh, channels. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.